Victories for Vinales, Morbidelli and Mia. No, this is not a repeat. Let's talk Argentina on Bike Live here on Motorsport 101. Let's go! Yes, welcome everybody to episode 7 of Bike Live here on Motorsport 101. And this show is going to sound a little bit familiar to you if you listen to our last MotoGP review show of the Qatar Grand Prix. Let's talk Argentina as we look back on the second round of the MotoGP Moto2 and Moto3 seasons, which saw victories for Maverick Vinales, Franco Morbidelli and John Mir, which sounds awfully familiar because that's exactly what happened in Qatar. Um, very, very different races, though, to the ones we saw two weeks ago. We'll look back on the chaos of MotoGP, something that always seems to be thrown up in Argentina, as Maverick Vinales took already a very sizable step towards the MotoGP title, even at this early stage, as Marc Marquez threw 25 points away in the gravel trap at Turn 2. We'll also talk about the weekend from hell for the Factory Ducati and Suzuki teams, and the weekend from heaven if you're working for the Aspar team. Uh, we'll also look back on the lower classes as Morbidelli went 2 for 2, and Marc Marquez, his brother, went south with another fall in Moto2. We'll also look back at Moto3 as John Mir proved that he can win from the back this time as well as from the front, coming from 16th on the grid to beat John McPhee. We'll also talk about all the big news in World Superbikes and some injury news in Moto2 and look ahead to this weekend's Easter Monday showdown at Brand to Shaky Burn makes his return to BSB. Um, my name is Lewis Sutterby. Thank you to all of you for listening and for downloading episode 7 of Bike Live. Joining me once again this week, it's Andre Harrison, star of the internet. Welcome, Dre. <laughs> what is wrong with you people you filthy filthy heathens just taking screenshots of my face during multiple opportunities um hello everybody welcome to episode seven um yeah not, not, not got much to say on this one yet but um crazy weekend of, of action um it, although we might be suffering from what we call groundhog day on here mm-hmm. Given the repeat winners, but um, yes, <laughs> um, looking forward to the show indeed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the the lesson from that one. I mean, I line last night. The, this this hangout that took place last night, which uh, was a way of us making up for the fact that we were we timed our recording horribly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Literally yeah, yeah. twelve hours. Cheers, off. Nando. Yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot, Fernando. Thanks a bunch for, for showing your shock announcement literally 12 hours after we finished recording <laughs> Dropping episode the bombshell of the year. <laughs> God damn you, Nando. Even when you're doing cool stuff, you have to find a way to begrudge me. It's terrible. Yeah, so we, so we recorded an emergency Google Hangout instead last night, uh, or last night as, as we speak, uh, on the Wednesday night, the 12th of April. Um, I finished work at 11pm, and uh, much to my shock, the Hangout was still going on, and hilarity ensued from there. Um, so uh, head, head to our YouTube channel if you haven't seen it, if you haven't watched it. Um, By the way, stuff you were partly responsible for, may I add? Yeah, yeah. Well, wholly responsible uh, at the end. Um, that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a neat segue into telling you all the different ways you can find us, because you can find that, that Google Hangout on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash motorsport101. Uh, we're on Twitter at motorsport underscore 101. You can also find us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash motorsport101. Um, our website, where all of that information is kept, is motorsport101.net. Um, you can find both of our weekly shows and a full list of podcasts on there. Um, as well as all usual places such as SoundCloud and the likes, and indeed iTunes. And of course, if you like us so much that you want us back as financially, you can by heading to Patreon, patreon.com forward slash motorsport101. Um, your support earns you early access to both Motorsport 101 and Bike Live. So if you're an early access listener, you'll know that already. Um, so go and get on down there because the uh, then what's the next target, Dre? Uh, $125 a month, which earns a t shirt a month, yeah? Yeah, it's a guaranteed T-shirt a month giveaway, and hopefully less screenshots of my face as compensation. <laughs> yeah, we're we're still still working on getting one of those printed on a T-shirt. Um, but uh, <laughs> but well, uh, do that. I will kill the person that finds it with my bare hands. Yeah, yeah. We well, now we know what our next tier is going to be. Um, yeah. But oh. uh, but yeah, um, a warm welcome to all of you um, for for listening to this episode seven of Bike Live, and let's get into the show. And talk Argentina, because the second round of the MotoGP 2 and 3 seasons took place at Temas de Rio Hondo um, in Argentina. We'll come on to the lower classes later on, but we'll start with MotoGP. And uh, Dre, Temas de Rio Hondo in Argentina always seems to have a habit of throwing up some on-ball situations, be it weather, be it tyres falling apart, or whatever it may be. Um, and this weekend was no exception, was it, given what we saw in the lead-up to the Grand Prix? We'll talk about the race itself shortly, but... Mm. 
the whole weekend from Friday morning right the way to Sunday morning just had us guessing, didn't it? Because nothing really went to the form book. Nothing did. It, the the track itself is really dirty because it's not raced on very often over the course of a year. So it, it takes a lot of bedding in for the track to really find its feet in terms of grip and speed. Throw in the fact that the, the, the riders had to run a harder compound Michelin tyre for six laps in FP1. Which they didn't otherwise, turn up. Otherwise, they'd have to get a penalty because they've had tyre problems before. Ask Scott Redding about, about that one as one of his rear tyres exploded at 120 miles an hour last year. Uh, delightful nights. It's like for his newly brown levers at that point in time. Yeah. But um, on top of that as well, it, it rained over the course of the weekend. Like Saturday morning pretty much washed the entire track clean anyway because, again, it rained on Saturday. So effectively, free practice two was a glorified qualifying session. Um, and then it started to rain again in FP3 just as it was starting to dry up again. So it was a chaotic weekend in terms of weather conditions, track conditions. And I, I don't think anybody really knew what they were getting themselves into by the time Sunday afternoon came along for the race. Um, it, again, luckily, Maverick made it all look very easy in the end. But the way we got there was a lot more complicated. Yeah, as, as you're going to hear throughout this show, we the three results were very similar to Qatar, but we had three very different journeys to get there um, across the three classes. And and as you say, the, 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 the there was a scenario on Friday morning or Friday across the two sessions where they had to run this new tyre, the bowling ball tyre, as they were calling it, um, on BT Sport, which basically is sort of code for rock hard. Um, a rock hard mm. tyre which the tyre never turned up to, to the circuit because it got stuck on the way there Custer um, yeah the World Superbike Thailand problem struck again um, so so that never happened on the Friday so that kind of the excuse that we were getting ready to, to build up for a couple of riders was that fell by the wayside and then as you mentioned Saturday morning it rained sort of midway through FP3 so a number of riders who were out of the top 10 had a chance early on to get a lap in but chose not to it then rained midway through and left them all stranded which left us Dre with the most star studded and loaded Q1 I think any of us have ever seen am I right in saying both factory Ducatis were in there I think yeah. Johan Zarco was in there yeah, Valentino was in there Valentino was in there Scott um, Redding was in there Scott Miller Redding, was in there Rosa. yeah um, it Rins was on the Suzuki Rins on the Suzuki, we will never see a more stacked Q1 than that, ever. Like, you've got the perennial powerhouses of MotoGP over the last decade. Um, and, of course, yeah. I don't know if you mentioned him, but Danny was in there. Danny Pedrosa. Yeah, yeah. Um, who, um, and he, he and Valentino Rossi ultimately got through it all. Um, they were the two showing there's no substitute for experience, both getting out of Q1 in the wet. Um, it was the hilarious... I don't know if you watched Quali Live... And it was the hilarious scenario where Valentino gets through. He goes quickest in Q2, whereas the checker flag comes out. And Keith Ewan essentially just signs off. He'd say, yeah, there we go, guys. Rossi and Dobby are through. Forgetting that Pedros is still on a live lap. <laughs> and knocks, knocks Davizioso out. And all of a sudden, Keith Ewan has to come back over the microphone and go, oh, sorry, guys. We had technical problems there. Yeah, of oh, course what? you did. Of course <laughs> you did. You just, you, 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 yeah, you, you, you waved the checker too early, Keith. Um, yeah, this pants too early. Yeah, um, and, and and both factory Ducatis were, were were victims of that because of course Lorenzo's pants in the wet, um, so he was out anyway. He was 16th on the grid and Dobby 13th on the grid. Um, so so with all of that, Pedrosa and Rossi and Pedrosa's no one's idea of a wet weather rider either, um, but he made it through along with Rossi. Um, but the shocks didn't stop there, Dre. When we saw the guy that ended up putting it right smack bang in the middle of the front row. Carol, goddamn Abraham, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Um, I, I, <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. The guy who probably had the least reason to belong on that grid no. um, put it on the middle of the front row. And this is the uh, thing, because a lot of people said on Saturday, oh, well, that proves a lot of people wrong. Everyone who slagged off Carol Abraham getting that ride, we're feeling a bit silly now. No, we're not. Because I think we all said that with validity, because he hadn't earned that spot on the grid. But now exactly. that he's now that now the, the that he's there, the, the, the long-term career criticism of Carol Abraham has long been justified for a very long time, as late as last year when he couldn't outbe he couldn't outdo Josh Brooks either on the no. same bike. So he was Abraham he was scraping per- his way yeah, into Abraham the points. Abraham has been a perennial disappointment in, yeah. in, in, in his career, especially given he he was a Moto Two race winner. For yeah. what it's worth. Absolutely. So, and hey, saying all of that, saying all yeah. of that, that doesn't mean we have no right to praise him when he does well. 
No, um, of course not. And and and, course and, not. and that's the thing. We have we we will give, we give credit where it's due on this show. Um, and and we're prepared to give that in spades to Carol Abraham. We'll talk about yes. the team a little more later on, and because they had a very very good race as well as it happened. Um, but Carol Abraham, for however he got there, however he got onto the grid, and this is kind of a discussion we can kind of have later in the year on what's going on with Lance Stroll. Because I think he'll end up doing very well in Formula One. However he got there, once he's there, he deserves the same kind of treatment as everyone else. And credit where it's due, Carol Abraham was inspired on Saturday and on Friday. Like, I did see the very funny clip on BT Sports' Twitter account where they tweeted Carrie Abraham literally thanking Mark Marquez for the toe on his yes. final qualifying lap, even though Marquez was three quarters of a second faster in qualifying. Again, just a level of confidence on Marquez might be his greatest strength and weakness sometimes. More on that in a bit. But, um, hey, credit where credit is due. That was a scintillating effort from Carol Abraham, and it was no fluke. The Aspars were fast all weekend, and given that Abraham did that on a two-year-old bike mm. is incredibly impressive, no matter what way you slice it and no matter what Abraham's previous reputation may tell you. That's incredible. That is a well, well-deserved um, front row start for, for Carol in the end. You know, it's not it's not going to suddenly melt away any criticism we've ever made of him in the past. But again, if you, you give credit where credit is due, that was a scintillating result. Yeah, because that that really did my head in when, when I heard that people saying, "Hey, I bet you feel silly for criticizing oh, yeah. him now." I'm like, not really. Uh, I heard many another podcast were, were, were very happy to have Carol Abraham be successful. And I was just standing there with a raised eyebrow, like, "Oh, come on now!" That like that's like that's your justification for the last four years. Really? Yeah. yeah. And uh yeah, credit to him. He had a he had a terrific uh Saturday and he had a good Sunday actually. He finished tenth in the end. Um which you know, from wherever he started, tenth for Carol Abraham is a good bag. And you you quite as you quite rightly say, uh, he is on the oldest of old Ducatis on that grid. Yes. Um the oldest bikes were the fastest, it turned out, um on Saturday, because the factory Ducatis, as we mentioned, didn't even get out of Q one. Um both Dovi um, and Lorenzo out, although one GP17 got through in the form of Danilo Petrucci. Uh, into the race then, and Mark Marquez led away from pole position, um, and with Carol Abraham quietly sort of sinking down the running order, as many would have expected him to, given the opposition he's up against, <laughs> um, the, the factory Yamahas came to the fore, being held back by Carl Crutchlow, who was, as he explained later on, taking it easy. Uh, in the early stages of the race and um, kind of playing the same sort of tortoise in the hair tactic that worked so well for him um, in Phillip Island last year where Mark fell off. Um, and history did indeed repeat itself, Dre, because Mark Marquez fell off. Um, now, <laughs> Mark Marquez's explanation for this after the race was kind of, well, he kind of knew that Vinales would be coming uh, and he, and he kind of wanted to build up a gap early on because he was already checking out at the front and people would have been excused for saying, hey, Mark, you've got a bit of a gap. Just take it easy. Um, but Mark didn't feel he was in a position where he could take it easy, and he got bitten for it. He, he, he's allowed to, to take the Johan Zarco playbook of how not to lead a MotoGP <laughs> Grand Prix from a whole fortnight ago. Poor guy. Um, yeah, I mean, I understand the logic. I do, I'm, like, I'm not criticising him for that. I can see where he's coming from, because Vinales did later prove to be very comfortable out there at the front and was a good two, three temps faster than anybody else on on track around Argentina in the grand scheme of things. So, yeah, maybe there was some credence to that. But you can't bin it on lap two. It's a terrible look. And listen, if, if, you, if you're truly the more conservative Marquez now that understands the value of scoring points, I don't know what you're doing pushing so hard on lap two on a track that nobody knows its true condition going into, given how unpredictable the weather and and the the level of grip and rubber on track has been for the entire weekend. Do this you is he, not. Think he just got carried away? Maybe, maybe he did. Maybe, maybe he thought, you know what? Sod it. Vinales is going to come in the second half of this race. I've got to put this gap out now. I know I'm comfortable around here. Oh wait, wait, where, where, where did my front tire go? <laughs> um, I, I I don't know. I, I no only Marquez knows what because it, what it went true. very early, didn't it? It did. It went very very early. That was very unlike Marquez, who normally has a habit of saving these, these some of these ridiculous sixty three degree lean angle front end slides he ends up having. But it, the the front went very very quickly on this one. Bizarre accident. Maybe again. Maybe he overestimated the amount of grip that was on the track at the time. Um. We'll never know for, for sure, but 
it it just seems like to me that Mark was a little bit too reckless. And he had no real need to build the gap up, if especially given that he is a rider that's got a tremendous amount of confidence in Argentina. He's won here twice before. Um, if anybody knows how to win around Argentina, it's him. He and <laughs> he's he he. This is this is one of the tracks he owns. So this was. This was a needless mistake, and it's one that could cost him very dearly in the long run. Mm, absolutely, because what, what kind of makes me think that he just kind of got ahead of himself is that Maverick Mignanes had literally just overtaken Cal Crutchlow for second. Um, it had just happened, um, like, moments before then. And I, I just have a wonder whether Mark perhaps glanced at his pit board, saw that it was Vinales now chasing and thought, I'm going to have to get on with it here. Um, I'm going to have to kick on and really pull away and down he went because he mentioned and he said this after with the race said he wasn't really on much lean angle as it happened he was on about 25 degrees lean angle um completely stable in the breaking points as he put it and then all of a sudden the front went from underneath him and down he went and maverick nyalis went on to win the grand prix um as we mentioned we'll come on to that shortly but um we'll talk mark marquez now and given that Mar- maverick has won the race and gone to 50 points from a possible 50 mark marquez from that fourth in qatar is stuck on 13 um Mark Marquez already trails by 37 points. Now, he's got 16 races to pull that back still, so it's very early yet. Um, but as we were talking about off-air before we started, Jorge Lorenzo holds the record in the MotoGP era for the biggest comeback, the biggest deficit ever to recover from to win a title. And that was 29 points. Mark has already got to break that. If, if anybody can do it, it's Mark Marquez. The issue I have is that I'm going to use a snooker analogy here. Mark Marquez is Ronnie O'Sullivan. He's not Mark Selby. He likes to run from the front. That's how he's won his championships over the last four years now. He he has been the guy that can punch hard and punch early and let the other guys behind him do the hard work to try and chase him. Because the way the calendar's been structured, Marquez is a strong starter hmm. because we've had Argentina and, and, and Cota in the first three rounds for the last three years now, three, four years now, where those tracks Marquez is bit, has been practically invincible around. And the last time he crashed in a, in a race as important as this one was Argentina last year. And again, he was never really inside the contention because he felt like he had to chase it. He had to, he had to overwork himself to try and get back into contention. As we found out later in the year after crashing at Catalonia, Catalonia another round, he did it five times that year. Actually, I think it was six, actually. But it's the same deal here. I mean, 37 points against Maverick Vinales, who is universally considered to be on the best bike and seemingly has a number on Valentino Rossi already. So his teammate's not going to be as big a factor, at least in the short term. This could be a really hard effort for Marquez. Marquez Marquez is even 23 points behind Rossi. This is a problem because Rossi again has been a perennial consistent point scorer now for the last three years in MotoGP. It's why he's been runner up for the last three years. That hey, he may not win very many, but he doesn't make very many mistakes either. And that is part of the that's part of the reason why he's contended for titles in this series. Because in twenty fifteen when Lorenzo won his final title, well, maybe not final title, but it's looking that way if I'm being honest. Yeah, to date. Um, yeah, to date. I mean, final title to date. I mean, Lorenzo won seven races. Valentino Rossi only won four, but Rossi was in command of the championship for the majority of it all the way through because he didn't make mistakes and he was a more consistent scorer. And Marquez hasn't really proven that yet. I mean, sure, he, he won the title last year, but a lot of that came down to Yamaha literally and figuratively imploding on itself on several occasions. Mm. Um, so it, this could be the toughest dogfight for Marquez yet. And by all accounts, Maverick is, is is a ridiculously fast learner. I mean, that's been proven. He won his second ever Moto3 race. He ran his second ever Moto2 race. And his first race of a factory team in, well, a proper, proper factory team in MotoGP. He, he's won the first two of those too. Maverick is an incredibly fast learner. He's, he's an incredible natural talent. And, He's done nothing but glowing things since since, he, yeah, since he's no, the there's no immediate sign of weakness yet with Maverick apart oh. from apart from perhaps his rain riding because he he wasn't exactly uh, stellar in qualifying on the Saturday he qualified sixth just ahead of his teammate Rossi um, on the Saturday but you're right with Marquez I mean I think back to 2015 because obviously his his three titles that he's won um, 2014 
of course, he just won the first 10, so he, he pretty much won the title by mid-season. 2013, he sort of took the lead mid-season and then, again, controlled it, similar to how he did last year, where he took the lead around sort of Catalonia time when, you know, he took Lorenzo out and then managed the points from there. Um, but he's now in that sort of 2015 position, isn't he? Where he has to go and chase it. And what happened when he had to go and chase it in 15? He fell off a few times. Um, because that big points lead last season allowed Marquez to to take that cautious approach, to not push his luck too much with the Honda. But yep. surely Dre is now in a position, starting in Texas, where Marquez is going to have to push his luck. He's going to have to make those points up. We talked about this on Twitter a few days back. We said that, simply put, we're not saying that Cota in in a fortnight's time is is a must win. It's I don't think we're quite in that ballpark just yet. But the argument I'd make is that I think I told you this. I think he needs two wins by Catalonia. Realistically, he's got to take points out of Vinales somewhere and keep this gap. Ideally, to within a race. I mean, there's no guarantee Vinales is going to be flawless between now and then either. But there's a lot of Yamaha circuits in there. Yeah, but like you say, Le Mans is a Yamaha circuit. Catalonia has been a, has been a Yamaha circuit in recent times. Jaref, I mean, Valentino Rossi dominated last yeah. year. And Mugello is definitely as Rossi circuit as you can get. Yeah. And he was pipped on the line by Jorge Lorenzo in Mugello last year. Another Yamaha sort yeah, of circuit. a race that Yamaha probably would have won had Rossi's bike not blown up um, that day. So, so yeah, it, Mark Marquez is, for me, Texas, it's, it's, it's close to a must-win, but surely, Dre, it's certainly a must-not-crash. No, if he crashes, it's it, it's done. If he crashes, it's done. There's no way, because it's, it's like Yamaha's. The Yamaha's look rock solid right now, and the Hondas still are learning. They're learning the Big Bang engine system. They're still in recovery, and they're still trying to find themselves. I mean, Marquez said it in Qatar. He said it's going to be multiple rounds before they figure this out. And you know, the the problem with that is is that. This was still going to be two weekends where Marcus was was going to be expected to win, so that would at least cover up some of the problems and put a band aid on it. Now it's a gaping head wound, hmm. and Marquez needs to win this round ideally, and if not, at least limit some of the damage in places like Haref when the European calendar starts up. Otherwise, he could be in big trouble. Yeah, because I think if we, we'll switch it to Maverick now. And you look at him, and he he seems quite confident. Speaking, I mean, why wouldn't he be? Um, but speaking after Argentina, he seems quite confident that he can really challenge there uh, in Texas. And I mean, Dre, he's he's confident enough as it is. Maverick Vinales, imagine the confidence he'll take if he beats Mark Marquez at his land of second Americas. You might as well rip his heart out like that scene from Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom, yeah. because. Like that that would be a body blow. Another one back to back. Because again, that is that is Marquez's two strongest rounds. And he Marquez could, is he unbeaten could, there. Yeah, and Marquez has never lost at the Circuit of the Americas. So for this to be a thing, I mean, we'll have to wait and see. Because again, Marquez has been invincible around around Cota and he's he's never put a foot wrong there. I mean, I don't I think I don't think that's gonna change this year for what it's worth, but Hey, if anybody right now thinks, thinks they're invincible, it's Maverick, and Absolutely. why not? He's, he's not been contested pretty much the whole season so far. He's been he's led almost every time in cheat this season to date, and he basically right now, as it stands, no matter what different answers we throw at him, he keeps changing the questions around. Like he's, he's answering everything we've thrown at him so far this season, and you know, passing every test with A plus score. So. What's it going to take? Is it going to take a Marquez signature circuit to break him? We'll have to wait and see. Mm, yeah, because Mark, Mark Marquez, not only has he never been beaten at the Second Americas, but he's never really been threatened there, has he? I not mean, even I, can't even, I can't even think of a, a Grand Prix at Cote where someone's actually challenged Mark for a win. Um, probably the first one where he, he sliced past Pedroza towards the end and then just gapped him straight away. And apart from that, he's, he, they've all been checkout wins um, for Mark Marquez where he's just taken the lead early on and just no one's seen him again. Um, so a lot of pressure on Mark to, to do that again um, this weekend and or next weekend should I say uh, at the circuit at the Americas uh, and Maverick Vinales is just in just incredible form Dre I mean that, that victory on, on Sunday of course he inherited the lead from Mark when Mark fell off but once he had it um, it just reminded me so much and uh, I mean this is a compliment it might not sound one at the moment but it reminds me a lot of watching Jorge Lorenzo on that Yamaha um, in that Mario yeah. Vinales, his consistency on that bike was so good. It was basically as if Mario Vinales went across that race with the attitude of, I'm going to set a pace, this is my pace, see if any of you guys can match it, and nobody could. You know, 
I've used the word to describe it on this show on multiple occasions. It's the metronome. Mm. It's the metronome. It, once it's set, it just keeps ticking and ticking. It's a, it's a good compliment. It's, it, I've described guys like Tito Rabat and Johan Zarco like that in the past, and well, that was arguably Jorge. That was how Jorge Lorenzo won races. He would mm. take the the combination of being a lightning starter and then being able to set a fantastic like metronomic sort of pace where nobody could keep up with him. Where again, the best way to beat Lorenzo was basically to punch him in the nose and and, and get into a fight with him and, get, and you know, make him dirty a little bit and see what happens. But nobody had an answer for Maverick's pace. No one. And I remember seeing they flashed up his lap times in the middle of the yeah. race, and they were to within a tenth almost every time. Within a tenth, it was just rock solid. Didn't put a foot wrong. And again, was not contested the entire race after 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 Marquez hit the deck, and once Maverick was clear, it was over. And again, as much as Crutchlow put in a good effort, Honda is not on the level of Yamaha right now, and it showed in in that race. Not only with Maverick being two or three seconds down the road by the time the race was over, but also the fact that Valentino Rossi was very measured in basically beating him. <sighs> Mm, absolutely, and uh, if you heard some sort of flicking through pages there, that was me flicking through MCN to try and find the page or the section on Maverick Vinales, and there isn't really one. Um, so, so let's devote a bit of time on this show to him, Dre, since MCN aren't going to, um, because because he, this is oh, just never. because this is yeah, because they've devoted a lot to the other side of the carriage yeah, as it happens, yeah. um, and we'll come on to him shortly. But um, yeah, fifty points from fifty for Maverick Vinales. He leads the championship at this early stage. Um, by 14 um, from from Valentino Rossi, his teammate. Um, and as I say, he's wet weather riding maybe, but there doesn't seem to be an obvious weakness with him now, does there? Which is amazing for a guy who's still only 22. He's 22, and this is only his third season in MotoGP. And again, he's, he's, he's this is not he's not even like this is this is his 38th MotoGP Grand Prix. And he, the biggest compliment I can pay him, and I've done this before in F1, where I've just said, it looks like he's been here five years already. And I know he's only been in it three, but he looks like he's been riding that Yamaha for years. Like you said, it was Lorenzo-esque. And that is as good a compliment as you can pay him, because Lorenzo is one of the great winners in the, in our sport. And again, he's, he's not put a foot wrong this entire season, really. I mean, sure, he was a little bit sloppy in the wet, but that's ex- that's to be expected. Again, like, no, like we're not going to kill a guy for not being wet with a specialist, given that it's not a massive factor in winning a championship. No. Unless you're Jorge Lorenzo, of course. Yeah. But, um, again, who cares if it was wet? Maverick won the Grand Prix in the end. So, he kind of says it all, really. Again, there's no obvious weakness in this man's game. He's an excellent qualifier. He's always been an excellent qualifier. Um, his race pace has been superb. He can overtake people. He's he's been in. He, he had to, he had to get a little bit dirty in Qatar with Dovi, but again, he we won that fight, won that battle. His tactical nous was was on display there. It was it was well displayed, and it, and it got him the win against a very game De Vizioso two weeks ago. And yeah, there, there's no obvious flaw in this man's game right now. And it's going to be up to, to Marquez and maybe Valentino to find one because at the moment he looks he looks flawless right now. It's it's terrifying. Yeah, it does. Perhaps just, I mean, I don't think it'll be long. If Valentino suddenly becomes competitive, I don't think it'll be very long before the mental game kicks in because I think that's yeah. possibly that's possibly now where we see Maverick weak in the past where perhaps he's lost his head a little bit um, on occasions. But I think that's be probably going back to the Moto3 days to find that. Um, when he was still a, still a boy, essentially. So that weakness may not be there anymore, but I guess it's up to, as you say, it's up to Marquez and Rossi to find that. I heard an interesting sort of analysis on the contrast between Vinales and Rossi um, over the Argentine weekend. And um, Rossi, of course, has been struggling pretty badly um, through the winter and through free practice on this new Yamaha for 2017. Um, and how much of this do you actually think, Dre, is down to the fact that Valentino Rossi is effectively having to relearn um, the Yamaha uh, and also, like learn a whole new bike. He's got all his baggage from previous years. And how much of it is down to the fact that Maverick Vinales has absolutely none of that, has just jumped on a brand new bike and gelled with it? It's, it's interesting, to say the least. It's very it's very polarizing. Like, like he doesn't have to unlearn anything, does it? Yeah, exactly. It's like, like Maverick just hopped on the bike and was immediately fast. Valentino Rossi has had years of tweaking his style. I remember famously he dropped Jeremy Burgess to go into twenty to twenty going to twenty fourteen. And that was basically seen as like the desperate last roll of the dice of Valentino. He actively admitted he copied 
a part of Marquez's riding style to make a difference. And again, Rossi, the Rossi of old seemingly returned. And like, is Rossi maybe changing his game up too much now to, to adapt to these Yamahas? I don't know. But it is very interesting to me that, you know, Valentino Rossi has is, is constantly claimed that he's struggling with this Yamaha, and yet he's got a second and a third place. I don't know whether that means he's just being Valentino Rossi, he's just that good on a motorcycle, and he's able to get the best out of a bad deal, or whether it's more a case of he's playing possum. And, and, and again, we all know Valley's good for mind games. Is, has he really got problems with that bike, or is it more of a fact that he, he's looking for a cover against Ma- against Maverick being that fast and that natural and, you know, being able to just to hop on the bike and be immediately fast? I mean, the Qatar test said it all when Maverick said, this bike's ready to race immediately, and, Ma- and Rossi openly said, we can't push it to 100% openly like this. So I don't know what the true story is. Mm, so, it also comes down to who you believe, doesn't it? Exactly. Because... Because I happen to think, and in terms of this championship, looking at Maverick and how many challenges he's got, whether it's going to be one or two, I still think Rossi is very much a contender here. In the, I think we're still seeing Rossi at his weakest um, at this stage of the season, and surely he's going to get stronger. If, we, if he hasn't figured it out by sort of Mugello, where um, he always challenges at the front in Mugello, he's always confident there and quick there. If he's not quick there, then I think we're going to have to get to the point where, when he, where is he going to be um, if he's not competitive there? And I just, I just, I just, the reason I think that is I just don't think Valentino Rossi would have been 16th in free practice on purpose. Um, there's no, no way no, no. he would have put himself in that position intentionally. I mean, the, the other sort of school of thought that I heard was quite interesting was that because he's getting to that stage now where he's, what is he, 38 now? Uh, Valentino Rossi in that, you know, it takes a lot of motivation to put it on the line and push to that, to go to that 10 tenths all the time. And perhaps Valentino Rossi is at the stage now where, you know, he always seems to pull it out of the bag on the Sunday, whether he almost saves that extra, that extra, one percent for Sunday, uh, and that perhaps he's ready to be maybe riding within himself on a Friday and a Saturday and saving his best for Sunday. I don't know whether it's that, um, which might explain why he's so often down the field on a Friday and a Saturday, but all of a sudden on the Sunday, there he is. Um, but that's twice now where he's had to come from deep on the grid, and um, however quick or slow he may be, and however the extent of the struggles are, Dre, for him to come from 10th to third in Qatar and seventh to second in Argentina. It's quite a good recovery job, all things considered. Yeah, it's a, it's a solid result. And given that a lot of the riders you'd expect to be hit, to see him contending with have made mistakes outside of Maverick, then he'll take it. I think like this this was not a round where Rossi was meant to win. And he still finished in, in, in second place. That is a that is probably about as good as a result as Rossi could have asked for going into the weekend. I think if you would have offered Valentino second before Sunday, he'd have bitten your arm off. Mm. So... I, uh, he'll gladly take that second, especially given how bad he was running in practice. Again, I don't know whether this is just Valentino being Valentino or whether it's just maybe it's just the decline. But he is 38 years old after all. This is what we're witnessing with Valentino already is unprecedented. We've never seen a 38 year old contender like this. Yeah, we can't the- exactly look at another yeah. rider from history and say, well, this happened to him because no rider's ever been this competitive no. this late exactly. in a career. Yeah, exactly. We're venturing into the unknown here. We don't know. Like, yeah. <sighs> Like it's not like in worlds where they they seem to be kinder to the riders over there, and you can win world titles at forty plus like Max Biaggi did. This is like this is unprecedented for MotoGP. I mean, this is a sport where even the younger guys can struggle with arm pump injuries, and you know are, are dealing with niggles and riding hurt at every every given day. And you know that's probably part of of, Ro- of why Rossi's so good is he doesn't crash, he doesn't get hurt. He's he's still in good he's still in good condition by the time he gets to Valencia, but. Again, like you said, we're in we're in uncharted waters. We don't know what we've never seen what a thirty eight year old can do on a top tier bike in MotoGP before. So we've just got we just kind of got to take this as it comes and see what happens because this is basically like a guinea pig experiment. We've never we've never seen this before, and we've just got to just take it around at a time because I don't know what what's going through Valentino's head. I don't know what's going through Valentino on the bike right now compared to Maverick and how deep this runs because at the moment it's just oh boy it's it, it's unexplainable right now it's 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 still a little bit in, on the inconclusive side i think again i think by the time we get to Magello, we'll know yeah absolutely because there'll, there'll be no hiding place by then i mean he'll have plenty of time to figure it out it's interesting though looking at his career valentino of course this is his 22nd grand prix season across all classes only eight times in those 21 before 
um, so just over one in three, had he actually started the season with two podiums out of two. Um, this is just the ninth time in 22 seasons he's actually been on the podium in each of the first two races of a season. Um, so he's not known as a fast starter um, no. to, to seasons, is Valentino Rossi. Um, so so it may well be that he just gets stronger and stronger as the year goes on. And given the way the title of the race has started, we might need him to um, to give us a championship because Maverick Vinales is looking stunning at the moment. Another guy who looked good in Argentina, Drake, was Cal Crutchlow, one of the few Honda riders, as it happened, not to crash. Um, over the course of the weekend, because of course both Marquez and Danny Pedrosa both entered the same gravel trap on the Sunday, um, both taking themselves out of the race. Cal Crutchlow spent a lot of time in gravel traps as it happens in recent months because he hasn't finished a race since winning in Australia, and lo and behold, the first race he does finish, he's back on the rostrum. Yeah, great result for Cal Crutchlow on that one. Sometimes it, it, it sometimes it goes to show you that winning a war of attrition can can uh, reap good rewards for you and. As you say, crutchlow has been on an awful run of form since that since that initial win in, in Australia last year, the second win of that season. It's just not worked out for him in that regard. But this was a really strong result for Cal. One of the strongest I've seen Cal ride in the dry for some time where he's running a comfortable second throughout. And it, sure, he was pipped to, to, to third in the end by Valentino Rossi, but that's no mean feat given the state of Honda and the state of Yamaha respectively at the moment. And Cal's gone strong in Argentina. Paul, remember, he, he, he mugged Ian only for third place a couple of years ago as well uh, in only his third race on LCR Honda. So, again, like, Cal has always had this uh, this level of quality where he can steal podiums and surprise people like this. I, I just hope it keeps happening more often because I, I like the fact that MotoGP themselves are now considering Crutcho to be an elite rider in the class. And I'm glad he's starting to ride like it because... Mm. This is. I think we might be seeing Cal finally reach his full potential because that was a very, very good ride from him to the, on, on that day. Absolutely, because he, he qualified on the front row as well. He's another guy who just seems to excel in the wet. Um, Cal Crutchlow, of course, he had that amazing pole at Silverstone last year where he was miles faster than anyone else um, mm-hmm. and then had that same pace in the dry on the Sunday. Um, we, we touched on the Aspar team earlier on in the, in the show. Carol Abraham stunning us all by qualifying second on the Saturday. He didn't quite hit those heights, as I mentioned on the Sunday. He finished down in 10th. Um, but that was more than made up for by the performance of his teammate, who had to come from 10th on the grid. And Dre, Alvaro Bautista, was fourth and closing on the top three towards the end. Yeah, that, that was just bizarre. I mean, it, it, I, I'm really glad that Alvaro Bautista seems to have found his feet again after a rough couple of years. And, like, his, his, his time... You know, helping a pretty get to the point where they're a decent factory again seems to have been rewarded because this Ducati GP16 has been very kind to him so far. This was an outstanding performance from Alvaro Bautista. The fact that he was running a comfortable fourth in there. And again, as you say, chasing down the podium group um, on that GP16. Very, very impressive indeed. And again, uh, he's another guy. Bautista is a guy that has had moments like this in the past where... On his day, you can ride like a top three, top five rider in the field. And <laughs> again, like, what a result. Is that Aspar's best ever finish in MotoGP? I think it is. Uh, well, I can't remember them having a podium um, in MotoGP. I mean, what amazes me about Bautista, he was only six and a half seconds off the win, Alvaro Bautista. Um, <laughs> on the Sunday, And he did that on the medium tyre, which which wasn't meant to wow. work. He, he, he ran the medium front, medium rear on that Ducati. Um, of course, yep. so many other riders ran the hard because, of course, Argentina, as last season proved, can be tough on tyres. Uh, and, and Alvaro not only made the medium work, but he was getting quicker as the race ended. And he, Because, of course, for a lot of that race, he was battling the, the Tech 3 Yamahas of Zarco and Folga and that group that involved Dovi and LH Spargro. Those two would disappear from that group, as we'll explain later. Um, but he, he took that group on, overtook them all, and then gapped them by nearly 10 seconds before the end of the race. He was nine seconds clear of Zarco in fifth. For the end of the race, and as you say, just a reminder of how good um, Alvaro Bautista can be. And I don't know, is this just a feature of the early rounds, Dre? These oddball early rounds that these old Ducatis are so quick because they started the last couple of seasons well. Maybe it is. Uh, again, I was just going to make the point that that this is not on paper a weak round for Ducati. They've run in podium spots here on multiple occasions. They are generally speaking pretty good around here. So. Yeah, again, I'm not totally surprised Bautista finished in fourth, but I'm surprised by his performance compared to the other factory Ducatis, which we'll get to. So, yeah, overall, a, 
just again, like I said, a great performance from Bautista. Only six and a half seconds off the win. That's incredibly impressive. It's a bit like Maverick Vinales at Australia a couple of years ago, and he was running with, the, with, with, with you know, just behind the leading pack behind Pedrosa. So I don't know whether this is just early performance niggles or whether Dorna really has pulled an ace out, an ace out of the deck on this one with how close the field is. I mean, practice free, for example, 2.2 seconds covering the entire field. On a mm. one minute fifty second lap, that's incredible. That is unprecedented. Yeah, sucks to be KTM. GT4. Yeah, sucks to be like KTM. Like KTM could not have joined at a worse time, <laughs> quite frankly, because they, they've joined in the year where MotoGP actively made an effort to make the field more balanced. Whoops. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and uh, just to just to tidy up on that, what we mentioned before on Aspar, their best ever result. They've only been in MotoGP since 2010 uh, in the top class because they were stars of the lower classes for so many years. It, in fact, it equals their best ever result in okay. MotoGP. And I'm amazed we didn't remember it because it was here a year ago. Eugene Laverty uh, oh, in Argentina yeah. where he got fourth um, in the Argentine Grand Prix with that stunning final lap last season. So it equals that. Um, their best ever result. They had a front row with uh, Barbara um, back at Mugello a few years ago. Um, but uh, but other than that, yeah, it is their, their best ever um, MotoGP result. It equals it, and it's certainly their best ever qualifying, um, thanks to Carol Abraham. So good weekend for them. Um, good weekend also for another of the uh, customer teams in MotoGP, the customer Yamaha team. Um, and that is, of course, Monster Yamaha Tech 3, um, who got both of their bikes to the finish this time, which was much of a relief to them after the events uh, okay. of Qatar, uh, where Zarco fell off. And they got them both to the flag trade in 5th and 6th, and they are very much the real deal this season, both Zarco and Folga. They, uh, Johan Zarco could be a contender for top independent this season. Like, like this is this is no fluke. The man is fast. Um, the like, it's clear that that 2016 Yamaha was clearly one hell of a bike. Not that we knew about it at the time because of how much they struggled on it, the front two on the factory teams. But this 2016 Yamaha is a weapon. My gosh. Um, Zarco and Volga have taken to MotoGP so, so quickly, so easily by the looks of it. And again, they've hopped in two, two rookies and they're running in the, in the top six comfortably. It's... It's crazy. I've not seen like Ricky impose Ricky impose like that since Marquez came around. So, yeah, incredibly impressive. Zarco is the real deal. Jonas Volga is is gonna have I think one round where he's just gonna absolutely shock people because that's what Jonas Volga does. Um, he's Mister Inconsistency. But uh, again, so far so good. Volga's again had two very good finishes to start the season. Zarco could have easily had a race win if he'd kept it under control a bit a bit much, but. Yeah, just just a very very impressive um, performance there from from both Tech Freeze again. That team has really come around from this last couple of seasons where it just you just you seem to be hearing about one rider struggling in that camp every year, whether it was Pole, whether it was Bradley, and they've lost arguably the two strongest independent riders in the field, and yet with two rookies they're doing just as good, if not better. Mm. Can't really mm. complain there. No, and um, and here's a stat that all amaze everybody. Monster Yamaha Tech 3 are actually second in the team's championship at the moment. Uh, you don't need to guess wow. who, the t- who the leading team are. It's Movie Star Yamaha, um, who are top the table with 86. Um, they're already some 59 points clear of the team in second, um, which is Tech 3. It's very close from second backwards because Tech 3 are second on 27. Then comes Pramac on 26. Um, Ducati's factory team on 25. Uh, Repsol Honda on 24. Um, and then Aspar on 21. Um, it's really close from second backwards, but yeah, Tech 3 second in the team's points. That's um, crazy. Early in this, this early stage in the season, just shows what a good job the team and their two young riders uh, are doing. And I mentioned Pramac there, who are, are third in that, um, and that's largely down to the consistent start of Scott Redding, who is one of the few riders, Dre, to have two good two good races so far. There's a lot of riders who've had one good race and one bad one. Yeah. Um, Scott Redding, to his credit, has had two very, very good races, and his reward at this early stage is fourth in the championship. Who would have put money on that at the start of the season? Yeah, just have Scott Redden in there with a the top four. Yeah, very, very bizarre. But again, Redden, it, it pays to be consistent in the early going when everyone's trying to find themselves. And Redden's had two very strong um, opening rounds on the GP16 Ducati compared to Danilo on the 17. Um, great job from Scotty in the early going. But again, this field is this field is so all over the place right now. I don't think anybody can say with confidence right now just how the field is right now. And again, I think we'll have to wait till Europe till we get a true a true sense of that right now. But 
It's going to throw up some oddballs, and Scott Redding, maybe it isn't an oddball, maybe it is, we've got to wait and see. But yeah, again, well, he's, he's, he's fourth in the championship based on a seventh and an eighth in the first two rounds, which um, yeah, you'd expect him to be a little lower down the standings with two results like that. But to his credit, um, you can only raise what's in front of you, and he's fourth at the moment. He is the top independent at the moment in the World Championship, ahead of Cal Crutchlow and Jonas Folger, who's third in the um, well, third in the independent and top rookie at the moment, um, based on the fact that he's had two point scoring rides. Uh, mm-hmm. It's amazing how close it is behind those two Yamaha riders who've already got a quite sizable gap on the field um, after two rounds. Um, only two factory teams actually scored points with both riders um, in Argentina. Uh, Yamaha, of course, were one of them with first and second. But the other Dre were KTM, uh, oh, yeah. who got both bikes to the finish in the points. Um, Paul Spargo and Bradley Smith, 14th and 15th, um, which I mean, it doesn't sound particularly spectacular. But for a team in its second race and the baby steps they're making, that was really the next step, wasn't it, to be scoring points so they can take that one off now. Indeed, in, in in the context of the, the, the they they could not have said it. They couldn't have entered MotoGP at a worse time, no. given, the, given the fact that Dawn has actively made an effort to balance the field by basically supporting the satellite teams as much as they possibly can. And when the field is littered with GP15s and 16s, and and last year's Yamaha's running up the front, and the, the Pramac boys have got a 17 to play with as well. It's this could not have been a worse situation for KTM to get themselves into. And yet, despite that, they're in the mix. And they've, again, they've scored points now for the first time. Both riders score points, which, which is a solid result, all things considered. So congratulations to KTM on their first pair of points as a factory MotoGP team. And the only way is up from here because, again, like I said, they face a much greater challenge than I think the Suzuki did when they joined a couple of years ago to be able to stand out and be quick in a field like this is going to be even more difficult. Um, an incredibly strong field of riders and much stronger bikes as well. More than I mean, all the GP 14.2s and 14s are gone now and everybody's on 15 production or Hondas are gone. There's, 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 yeah, there's no weak team anymore. No, there right, isn't. The most there GP isn't. that they can just pick off. But um, yeah, to their credit, they, they, they made a clear step forward from Qatar and where they were kind of lonely at the back. They actually ran in the same group as the likes of Rabat, and Barbara this time um, finished right behind Tito and Barbara, so they were only um, a couple of hundred meters or a meter, a few meters away from finishing 12th and 13th rather than 14th Absolutely. and 15th. And they beat Yanone, um, although he had his own problems, as we'll come on to now, because it was a weekend from hell um, for the factory Ducati and factory Suzuki teams. Um, we'll start on Suzuki first, Drake, because I guess they've got a bit more of an out for this. Um, they've got a bit more of an excuse because Rins crashed on a broken ankle. Uh, and Yanone fluffed the start. He jumped it. About time. Or oh, did got he away jump it? <laughs> I mean, about time, given he got away with that one in, 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 in Mugello a yeah, couple true, of yeah. years ago where he, he, he left on the zero and we, well, then that means he jumped it. But I don't care what anybody tells me. That's a jump. But um, in any case, yeah, I mean... Yeah, Yanone was unhappy about this after the race, wasn't he? He was very unhappy with race direction because it was kind of Yanone's jump start was kind of like one of the ones we see where we see guys thrown out of hundred meter sprints in athletics for the twitch on the lines. Yes. He didn't really seem to move forward, did he? He just sort of moved in his grid slot. Ugh, I get it. I get why he'd be upset, but mm. unfortunately, you run wrong. the risk. Yeah, you run the risk of getting the penalty if you're moving in your box. Like if 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 the naked eye can see it. It's going to cause a problem. And if the if race directions, I'm, I'm sure they have. They've looked over the footage. And I don't know if he gained an advantage by doing that or whether he if the front wheel moved forwards after, you know, the, or before or after the red light went out. But if race directions giving you a penalty for it, you've probably done something wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't get this wrong very often. And they are, they are, the two for race direction are very good at what they do for the most part. So I don't think Ian only has got much of a case on this one because in hundred meters, if you, if you twitch, you, you're going to get the false start because it could trigger other people. It can, exactly. it can set other people off and jump the start as well. It's, so it's, exactly. We saw that in Moto2 last year. So it's, you can't do it. You just can't do it. You run that risk. And I'm, I'm deep down. I'm sure Ian only knows that too. Mm. Yeah. I think he was just cranky because he, he, he came so close. He's probably a lap away from getting himself back into the points because he caught the KTMs right at the end, um, but just couldn't quite pass them. Um, and as I mentioned, Alex Rins crashed in the race. He'd, gone into the weekend already on a broken ankle so for him to do to be there and be competitive 
uh, although he did qualify last, um, was almost a result in itself, and he didn't end up getting to the flag and getting any points uh, himself. So they have an excuse, Dre, I guess, Suzuki. You can kind of explain away their bad weekend. Surely there are no excuses for the absolute, well, shit show that was the Factory Ducati weekend. Awful, 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 awful. That's the weakest I've seen the Factory Ducati team since the days of the old Desmond Deshies, when Valentino Rossi was riding them and Nicky Hayden was limping them around and they were just terrible bikes. And they've got no excuse. Like, when Alvaro Bautista is one of the fastest men on track on last year's Factory Ducati, you've got no excuse. And Dovi... Even Dovi, who, to be fair, was taken out by Alicia Spagaro. He won't want to go to Argentina again. <laughs> no, like, he, like, 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 Dovi must be like, oh, God, not again. Um, and poor Dovi, for, to a degree, on that one. But it's not like he was running in a particularly strong position either. Lorenzo, his championship might already be over with 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 basically next to nothing to his name points-wise up two rounds. And again, Dre, Dre, some people are already rubbishing the Lorenzo Ducati experiment as over. <laughs> which I couldn't believe when I was hearing people. It's like C- Colin Edwards and Neil Hodgson were speaking on BT Sport of the weekend and were sort of talking about it and they were saying there are people genuinely in this paddock qu- asking the question, is Jorge finished? Which I can't believe. You're talking that like a guy that's a top eight rider yeah. of all time is is finished after two races in, in Ducati. I mean, it's because they've gone that badly. You know what? People want a hot take. People mm. want a hot take, and they've seen Lorenzo struggle, and like this is their chance to jump on him um, because he's had a near flawless Yamp like career so far. People have got to remember, all Jorge Lorenzo knows is riding Yamahas. That's all he's ever known in the MotoGP class. I can't imagine the challenge mm. of jumping onto a Ducati like that and riding something different after a nearly a decade in the top flight that's that can't be easy especially for a guy that's already 29 years old in his prime and has had to give up the best bike in the field like so to write it off after two races is just shit journalism in my opinion and they should and people in the paddock should know better um don't get me wrong i'm not saying that he's going to win a title or he might he might not even win races this year the way this is going but i think people are underestimate yeah, I think people underestimated the challenge that Jorge Lorenzo was had in front of him even going into this season, let alone rubbishing it off after two rounds after being taken out on the opening lap in, in Argentina. I was like, I like, that's the death bell for Lorenzo as a rider. The fact he was taken out inadvertently in a first corner in Argentina. Like, that's your death sentence right here? That, that's, that's bullshit. So I don't buy that in the slightest. But it's a shame... And I, I think I'm going to chalk Lorenzo off my list of potential title winners after that one. But again, yeah. no, no real fault of his own, but he wasn't running strong at any point this weekend anyway. So I think it would have been minor points at best. Uh, well, it's Lorenzo. funny because Lorenzo was quite sort of optimistic, I think it's the word afterwards. He was actually talking about how he thought he would have probably been in that sort of Bautista group. He said, I could have battled with Bautista for fourth or fifth, um, which I think is optimistic, um, given that he was 16th on the grid. Um, but yeah, I I I'd I laid, I'd laid that firmly at Lorenzo's door. That first corner incident that was very un Lorenzo like. Um, I mean, I, admittedly, he's not a guy used to being that that like, deep on the grid anyway. Um, but he just seemed to basically run up the back of you know from from what I could see uh, at turn one, which was which was a really strange one. Um, certainly, no doubt about the Davizioso incident, Dre down at the hairpin with Alicia Spargo. He was just playing wrong place, wrong time. We've had we've said this one before with Dovi, haven't we? Mm. Um, it's such a shame. Um, um, Alicia Spagaro goes into the hairpin way too hot, loses the front. He's already gone. Dovi's riding, minding his own business. He just gets collected. Yeah, he wasn't even going for an overtake. No, it's, it's just like Alicia's come from that far back, and there's absolutely nothing Dovi could have done about that. He was basically a, a sitting target. Um, he just had as Alicia's tor- crash, basically. Yeah, exactly. As Alicia just torpedoed him in, in, uh, in inadvertently there, and he was just involved in another man's accident again um, for the second time in consecutive years in Argentina. Um, so. Three consecutive second places in Qatar being beaten by Yamahas and now back-to-back consecutive I've been taken out by another rider <laughs> in Argentina. God forbid what happens to him in Kota. Like, mm. the yeah, because Pedroza is going, took him out there last year. Like, the way this is going, and I, I fear for Dovi's existence in, Argent- in, 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 in America because it's just not looking good for the poor guy. Um, 
It's a real shame, and I, I'm glad that Elish, being the good sport that he was, immediately apologised and was very humble in his in his immediate apology to Dovi, who looked like he was a bit shaken up by the accident there. And um, I'm I'm glad Elish was um, you know handled it with, with such class and maturity. It's just, it's, just, it's a shame, and it's, it's a shame because Elish had such a brilliant round in Qatar, and he was running pretty well. Yeah, again. He was looking like he was going to do the same in, in Argentina, wasn't he? He he was one of those guys like Bautista who was gaining as the race went on absolutely just such a shame on on um, all round um just a, just a couple of bad results really um for, for um for in in that stretch just 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 sheer bad luck it's a shame because both of them were running fairly well given the circumstances especially Alicia again and um he'll he'll, he'll root to regret that one but um just just no winners all round it's just just a sad state of affairs really Dovi just bitterly unlucky and Alicia Spagaro just made a made an inadvertent mistake. Mm. You know, sometimes it comes together like that. It's just really unfortunate. Mm. Yeah, after all of that, here's how it all finished. Then uh, Vinales the winner um, for the second race in a row from Rossi in second. Yamaha one and two. Um, Crutchlow taking third. That's his first podium since Australia last year. Bautista in fourth. And um, that's his best result since he was on a Grassini Honda. Zarco fifth on number five. Jonas Folger sixth. Um, Daniel Petrucci 7th on the 2017 Ducati so at least one of them had a decent weekend um, ahead of his teammate Scott Redding on the 16 Ducati Jack Miller in ninth, proving again as he did in Qatar that he's a genuine top 10 threat now on that Mark VDS Honda and Carol Abraham one of the stars of the weekend certainly on Saturday he went from the front row back to 10th uh, the other points were filled by Loris Baz Tito Rabat Hector Barbara uh, injury and all and the two KTMs of Paul Espargaro and Bradley Smith Championship standings then. These are going to sound a little odd um, because I don't think many people expected this to be the championship state of play after two rounds. It's Vinales who leads it on 50 points. He leads Rossi by 14 uh, in second. Then there's a 16-point gap to Davizioso in third. Scott Redding is fourth on 17. Cal Crutchlow fifth on 16, ahead of Jonas Folger on 16 in sixth. Jack Miller is seventh. Mark Marquez is eighth on 13 points, level with Bautista. Uh, and Danny Pedroza is 10th on 11 points. So the Repsol Hondas are 8th and 10th in the points um, at this early stage of the season. And that top 10 that I just mentioned, of course, does not include Jorge Lorenzo. Let's move on to Moto3 then next. Uh, and the man who inspires the name of the show, um, Joan Mir, who won the Moto3 race just as he did in Qatar. Um, and in some ways, Dre, this was more impressive than his win in Qatar. As impressive as that, as that was, it was a sort of a Binder Oliveira kind of performance uh, out, in, out in Qatar where he won from the front and just looked like he had it on control. Um, but having made a complete porridge of qualifying and starting on the sixth row of the grid, mm-hmm. Joan Mia still came through and beat John McPhee at the end. Uh, like McPhee must have just been sitting there like Fernando Alonso during the end of the 2012 season where he's like, wait, that's a Leopold. How is Mia <laughs> back here? <laughs> yeah, given that he uh, was on pole. Yeah, it's just like he was on pole. He knew Joan Mia was starting from row six. Row six? And within half race distance, Mir was in the lead in back and, and basically leading the race. And wow, um, Joanne Mir is the real deal, everybody. Yeah. Um, clearly, like this is this is this was not a fluke. Like the man has got legitimate, fantastic race pace. Um, pushed his way through the field, did what he had to do. A couple of near misses, a couple of uh, tetchy ones there, but. He made some fantastic passes when he needed to be. Um, like the, the double move at the hairpin late on was astonishing stuff. Um, yeah, like Joan Mir has really found his feet in Moto3 so far this season. And yeah, the qualifying was a little bit ropey, but the, the grit and the determination he showed to get to the front uh, and, then, and then to win the race fairly comfortably in the end on that final lap. He, again, he, he did what he needed to do. He got the gap out to start the lap, knew the slipstream wasn't going to be a factor. And was seemingly in control by the end of the race there. Just fantastic stuff from Joanne Mir. All all race long again and very, very impressive. Absolutely, because 
as I say, he came from the sixth row of the grid, 16th on the grid. And hey, it's not like Leopard's a mess up a qualifying session, is it, Danny Kent? Um, so, so Joanne Mir had all that work to do. And it wasn't so much just the fact that he came through and won, but as I, as it looked, because we saw a few of the overtakes from on board, Dre, quite a few of them were just hot knife through butter, weren't they? Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's it's not like these are tool sheds he's passing no. here. These are some genuinely great riders he's passed along the way. Title, perennial title contenders, multiple time race winners, some incredibly strong riders that that that, that he's passing along the way. And this is again, this is this is Joanne Mir's twentieth Moto Three race. Some of these guys like Fanati, like I think this is his fifth season in Moto Three as a full timer. Mm. And Get into the, the start. yeah, exactly. If you're someone like John McPhee, who, as we mentioned on last week's show, is the second most experienced man in, like, he's actually he's the most experienced man in the Moto Free field now. Mm. How does it feel knowing you got beaten by a guy that's been Rookie of the Year on two separate races last year? Another young one's come along and might be able to take control of the, take control of the um, of the cast as it stands right now. I can't be promising for McPhee knowing that, especially given all the backing that's going into him this year. It's a bit alarming, but. Mm. Uh, whew, um yeah joanne mir is asking a lot of asking a lot of questions of the rest of the field right now yeah because my big question at the start of the year was and i said this with bex on the on the season preview we did where i wondered whether joanne mir would be a threat because he and leopard had for the third season in a row switched bikes leopard had won the title with danny kent on a honda switched to ktm for last year and then gone back to honda and of course mm-hmm. joanne mir was with the team last season when he ran ktm so joanne mir was having to ride on a bike that he hasn't ridden in moto 3 before um, so I'm pretty sure even when he was riding in CEV, um, John, John Mir was challenging for the championship. I'm pretty sure he was on a KTM then. Um, mm. So this is his first experience on a Honda. Uh, and John Mir is just destroying the field. And like we say, it's, you're quite right in what you say on that final lap, where it almost looks as if John McPhee was defending second rather than going for the win. Um, and that's got to be a concern for the rest of the field, that John Mir just seems to have this extra gear when he needs it. It's, it's so much so that uh, perennial John McPhee fanboy Keith Fewen actively pretty much accused Mir of having an illegally fast Honda in the middle of that race. Oh, uh, about halfway through, he pretty much says, well, the fact that John McPhee couldn't pass Joanne Mir under slipstream is quite controversial, Jules. And oh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing there to a degree, but he basically was implying because we all know KTM and, and Honda pretty much hate each other at this point. Most of that's from KTM. But this was Honda on Honda, and like Hewen was actively implied suspicion as to how fast that Leopard Honda was in comparison to McPhee's British Talent Cup bike, which you know is you know is questionable professionalism from Hewen yeah. at best. Um, yeah, but I would choose to use the word bollocks, uh, quite frankly. I, yes. mean, I mean, what would Honda have to gain by by deliberately favouring one of their teams over another, given that they seem to have a monopoly at the front of the field right now? especially given that Dorna is actively pumping money into McPhee's own team because mm. it's in their best interest to bump up the British talent team for you know, in, 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 in the long term. It, they, it's, it's in their interest to bump McPhee up the field as, as the advert for British bike racing now. So, yeah, like that, we can poo-poo on, we can, we can shit all over yeah, that. Yeah, sure, for me, I think it's much more down to how just Mia seems to have his bike set up because he was really quick out of the final corner down the straight in Qatar, wasn't he? Like no, yep. no one ever slipstreamed John Mir down the front straight in Qatar a couple of weeks ago. Um, exactly. And I don't know, Keith, maybe it's possible that two bikes, the identical bikes, might be set up and geared a little bit differently? Very true. Very true. As you say, like the, the key part of, of Mir in Qatar was that he was always able to lead over the line. A very important factor was that he could draft people fast enough so he could overtake them by the start-finish line and that he was always the most difficult bike to draft off of. That's how I was able to lead so comfortably in Qatar. And Leopard know what they're doing. Let's put it that way. And again, Mir was solid last year. This is not, again, this is not a complete fluke. Joanne Mir has had many a, a very strong result. He won as a rookie in Austria last mm. year. So this is not a new thing for Mir. He knows how to win races. He knows how to lead from the front. He knows how to pack race. So this like this shouldn't be as surprising as it is to people like Keith Ewan that Mir is this good. Because the field kind of got gutted last year, and we, we basically we looked at Moto Three as a great big pool of we have no idea who's really going to win this. And you know, Mir was a minor shock, but 
again, he's just been so good. And the way he's, the way he's set it up, the way he's ridden from tactically has been practically flawless so far this season. From whether he started from the front, whether he started from 16th place, he's been excellent at it from the start. And that's beyond criticism and that's beyond suspicion. He's just that good right now. And, and if the most experienced rider in Moto, in Moto3 now, in John McPhee, has had two races with no answer for him, that should say a lot about what Joanne Mir is doing right now. Mm, yeah, and uh, I guess the the only sort of um, comment that I would have, or the invitation I'd have to Keith Ewan if he's listening to this, uh, is just read the title of this episode. Don't cry for Mia, Argentina. Um, a big shout out to Marge on Twitter for coming up with that one. Yes. Um, uh, the, the brilliant sort of headline that she came up with after the Moto3 race finished. And uh, I don't think John McPhee, to be honest, will be, will be crying at the end of that, will he, Dre? Because, I mean, let's let's face it, this isn't the guy that's used to running at the front in Moto3. Um, as experienced as he is, his only win came in a wet race um, last year at Bruno. And I'm pretty sure he, he would have... He wouldn't have expected the same guy to beat him twice, but I think if you'd offered John McPhee two seconds from the first two races, he probably would have taken it. Absolutely. I mean, again, 40 points is 40 points. That's mm. two very strong results. McPhee's had a couple of these before, and the fact he's racking up these results will mean he'll be in title contention. I mean, in Moto3, consistency is even more important than ever before because of how close these races tend to run. If you're regularly running in the, in the top three or four, you're, you're well on the way to winning a championship because consistency is hard to find in Moto3 because it, the, the races are so unpredictable. And it's rare where you've got the same one or two guys up the front every single round. That just doesn't happen very often. It takes someone like a Jack Miller in the past or someone like Miguel de Vera or Danny Kent was when they were in Moto3 towards the end of their runs. Um, so, yeah, at the moment, yeah, just... just it, 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 Like, Muffy, again, like you say, if, he, if, if in February, if he, if he would have offered him 40 points to, out of the first two rounds, I'm sure he would have gladly taken it. And he'd have probably thought probably, he'd be championship leader as well. Exactly, exactly. He probably would be leading the title with 40 points after two rounds. The problem is, Joanne Mears won both of these opening rounds, so that could be a problem. Mm. I guess if he's gonna if he's gonna launch a title charge, this is all he can do. Just stay with Mia um, and just try and just take the seconds uh, where he can get them and, you know, Let's see if John Mir can do this again uh, in Kota in a couple of weeks. Um, a circuit where, from memory, Fanati won at, at a canter last year. Um, and given that it's the pretty much the longest track on the calendar um, circuit in the Americas, exactly. it's not really a circuit that suits Moto3, does it? Um, well, I don't think we've really seen a classic Moto3 race around Kota. Uh, and we've been going there for four or five years now. So, yeah, n- next weekend may not be this quite so... Uh, representative as how the rest of the season is going to go. And as you say, consistency is the watch word watch in Moto3 because you don't often see the same guys up the front, which makes this weekend in Argentina all the more odd because we had an identical roster um, to the opening round Indeed. in Qatar. Mia, McPhee and Jorge Martin, who proved that he doesn't need qualifying to be cancelled for him to be up the front and competitive. Absolutely. Jorge Martin has, again, seemingly raised his game this season. He had a couple of flashes last year. I think the one in Bruno stands out the most in, in the wet. But, again, he didn't need a, a, a questionable pole position or anything like that to prove that he's got top-tier level speed now. Martin has really improved this year. I, I'm, again, I'm glad for it. It's seemingly, he's going to be up the front for the rest of the year. That The team he's with, the setup he's got, again, just, just a good all-round unit now. And Martin is challenged for wins both rounds now so yeah absolutely great to see that he's, he's got back-to-back podiums for his name and he's becoming a top tier player in the class so we have to wait and see again seeing in the long run if he can keep that keep that going but uh whew, like, the, the, like repeat podiums are rare in moto three so that's a great result for martin mm, it is and uh, he's another one i think kind of like mia where it's one of those where you're surprised when he does well but then you kind of shouldn't be surprised when you when you just kind of look at his resume because um, Martin, he he's a former Red Bull Rookies champion, um, and he was probably the most dominant of dominant Red Bull Rookies champions we've ever had. Yeah. Um, back in 2014, I want to say, I'm pretty sure I remember him on a Red Bull Rookies bike. I think it was 14. To, when I first yeah. went to Silverstone, he was on that 88 um, Red Bull um, Red Bull Rookies bike. Um, and of course, he spent his first two seasons on Mahindras uh, in this in this class. He's with the Aspar team last season in, in Moto3 on the Mahindra, um, and that bike's not exactly pulling up many trees this season. It has to be said. So, mm. so Martin's finally got a strong bike underneath him. He's on the Honda that's pretty much the class bike in the field right now. 
and he's making the most of it and looking very good. And um, and that's probably the main story, isn't it, I guess, Dre, from the first two rounds, is the fact that the Honda looks like the bike to be on because Andrea Migno has twice now been the first KTM home, and this time he was only fifth. Yeah, interesting to see that right now Honda seem to have the me- seem to have the measure of KTM, and KTM is going to be mad salty about that, mm. um, to say the least. But yeah, very interesting to see that to see that be a thing. Mino again, another guy that seemingly has come a long way in the last year and a half or so. He's now running up the front with a, with a few of these guys now, and yeah, like I don't know if KTM is just lacking in top in top tier speed at the moment. I don't know whether it's that or whether it's just they haven't got the same grip. But mm, or maybe who, made made the wrong call with their factory rider in maybe, Antonelli. Maybe, maybe Antonelli wasn't wasn't the wasn't the uh, the ace in the hole that we thought he was going to be. I mean, I certainly thought Antonelli was going to be another great move to go over there. But right now, like KTM's got some question marks over what's been going on and. Again, Antonelli might be a bit of a harsh criticism because it's it's seemingly mm. like it was like he was taken out by Fanati this round, which is a move that surprises no one. <laughs> but but in any case, yeah, KTM don't look, don't look like, like where's the big KTM hitter going to come from? Is it going to be yeah. Antonelli? And if not, who who who's it going to be then? Yeah, <laughs> that's the kind of the question because yeah, to, to the to that point to Antonelli and his race because. <laughs> Um, Moto3 saw a bit of controversy around uh, Tomas Rio Hondo at the weekend. Antonelli was the first one. Romano Fernandes, who has a history of turning people's bikes off in Argentina, they did it again this weekend, although he took a more crude way of doing it um, by pretty much punting Antonelli off uh, on the first lap. Um, I think that incident, Dre, is kind of clear cut. Fernati basically wiped him out. Um, yeah. The, the Bulliger Di Gian Antonio incident down at the hairpin towards the end in that second group, um, that was naughty from Bulliger, wasn't it? It was seemingly a bit naughty. I think Budigo had, had, had gone in too hot, and um, yeah, he's just he's just ploughed into the side of another rider there. And uh, yeah, Giantonino had no answer for that. And again, I don't think he'd have done anything about that one either. Um, very bizarre accident there. B- Budiga seemingly got away with that one, but he got. A, I, he, he's funny. He got a penalty after the race, which kind of knocked him out of the points. I think he only finished sort of twelfth or thirteenth anyway. Um, right. but I think he got a two-second penalty after the race, which equated to about four spots. Okay, so, okay, that's that's, that's that's actually pretty fair. That I can't I can't complain about that. That's that seems pretty fair in the in the context of what happened. It's a shame we took out Giantino, who was running very well indeed in that in that race. Budiga was running in that front pack as well. But yeah, a bit of a naughty accident. Seemingly, he's broke he's braked very hard and hit a dude in the braking zone going into the hairpin. Unfortunate to say the least on that. Um, yeah, can't can't argue with that. Definitely penalty worthy, and I think the right call from race direction. Mm, yeah, Bulliger had qualified second on, on the Saturday with a sort of banzai lap uh, towards the end of qualifying, which put him on the front row along with John McPhee um, on the Saturday. Um, in that incident where Bulliger took Dijon Antonio out, uh, and Air Bastianini was kind of in the background having his own crash, um, kind of in sympathy, he fell off down at the same corner. Um, and that's the big shock, really, Dre, from these first two rounds. Two of the title favourites, Bulliger and Bastianini, still yet to get out of the starting gates. Both have no points from the first two rounds and are already 50 points off the lead. And there's a strong chance they won't get them back. Yeah, I think they might be done already. Like, Bastianini was Bulliger my... was my pick. <laughs> yeah, Bulliger was your pick. Bastianini was my pick. So, <laughs> yeah, we're both equally up shit creek of about a paddle on this one. Unfortunately, um, yeah, Bastianini has been a big disappointment for me so far this season. Again, crashed in this race. This is this was meant to be the move for him. Like mm. he's like he's going to Australia. It's the this move year. he caped so hard for a year ago. Yeah, exactly. Navarro was was very strong on that team last year. That was seemingly like the last piece of the puzzle for Bastianini going to a top tier team. And yeah, he's been nothing but a disappointment so far. Arguably, he probably has been since the second half of last season too. So. Maybe any has hit the wall in terms of talent, but that's a that's that's a, that's a sad one. Bulliger, he was title favorite with the bookies going into this, a, a very slim one, may I add, given the, how how open it was. But Bulliger again has not ridden like the rider of last year. Again, maybe Haref will come around, and then Bulliger comes back to his best, like it was like, like he showed last year. But very bizarre to have two big big hitters in the championship of of last year, just uh, be very disappointing so far. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to have to have a look after this show and listen back to our season previous. I can't remember who Bex picked as Moto3 champion. It better not have been Joan Mir. 
Um, I'm pretty sure it wasn't. Um, but um, but yeah, we certainly have got it wrong so far. With, with our two picks, they're both 50 points off the pace. Here's our Model 3 finish. John Mio, the winner again, from John McPhee, again, and Jorge Martin, again. Um, just point three covering the top three. Philip Ertl just off the podium in fourth, having not been taken out by uh, Juan Fran Guevara this time, as he was uh, in Qatar, or more to the point, he took him out. Um, Mino in fifth on the first of the KTMs, just ahead of Livio Alloy on the second of the Leopard bikes. He won the battle of the second group, ahead of Romano Fanati. Uh, he finished a very average seventh. Tatsuki Suzuki, a very impressive eighth, ahead of Juan Frank Guevara in ninth. And Kato Toba, the top rookie home, in tenth, um, which is quite a result for him. Aaron Cannon in eleventh. Darren Binder in twelfth, ahead of Marcos Ramirez. Tony Arbolino, who was quick at various stages of the weekend, he finished fourteenth. And Maria Herrera, fifteenth, and the final point, courtesy of Bulliger's penalty. Championship standings then are led by Mia, 50 points to McPhee's 40 and Martins 32. Mino is fourth on 21. Then comes Fanati on 20. Canet on 18. Livio Loy on 14. Philip Ertl on 13. Marcos Ramirez on 10. And completing the top 10 is Nicolo Antonelli, who has 9 points. He trails already by 41 points. Uh, into Moto 2. And again, stop me if you've heard this before, a repeat winner. Uh, this time, Franco Morbidelli. Um, winning his second race in a row. And um, it's kind of funny, isn't it, Dre? Because we did say a few times that Franco Morbido is the kind of guy that once he gets his first win, he'll win a few of them. And he's starting to prove us right. Ding, ding. Chalk one up for, for Bike Live on this one. We got a good one this, this time around. Yeah. Again, Frankie looked very comfortable up the front pretty much from start to finish. Um, and he, okay, Marquez gave him a little bit of a threat towards the end there. But again, Morbid that he seemed to have another gear in him towards the end of that race as well. Just a very, very professional performance from Morbid that he again took the whole shot, didn't look back again. I sound like I'm in Groundhog Day like, talking about this because it was almost a carbon copy of Qatar. Only this time, Marquez was able to run him a lot closer than what we got in Qatar. But ultimately, same result. Morbidelli looking pretty comfortable, made the hard passes at the start of the race when Miguel Oliveira was knocking, got the gap going, had the ultimate pace to, to set the tone of the Grand Prix, and only really Marquez and, and Oliveira was able to keep up, and Mar Marquez, was, he basically forced Marquez into overriding the bike, and instead he ended up not finishing. So, yeah, it was a pretty comfortable win in the end for Morbidelli. Not really under any true pressure, but uh, a great result regardless. He really is up there now. <laughs> yeah, he is up there. And at the moment, it doesn't seem as there's anyone up there who can consistently challenge him. Because Thomas Luti was his main threat in Qatar, although Luti always goes well in Qatar. So that wasn't really yeah. a shock. Luti, although he inherited a podium with Marquez's crash on the final lap, came through to third, but it was a very distant third in Qatar this time around. So it's already a bit of a warning sign for this year's championship in Moto2 that Morbidelli looks like the consistent top tier guy and no one else seems to be a consistent threat to him. Absolutely. Yeah, like that that seems to be the, the pattern here that again Luti was Luti even admitted after the race that he said it was the luckiest podium of his career. He, he knows he didn't deserve that third place and it was through an Alex Marquez error that he inherited it. And yeah, Luti was not a threat. It was it, it was his own teammate and, and Oliveira this time that was the threat and not him. And so again, Frankie's going to have a very nice second championship lead if this keeps up, if the other guys in the, in the class are all beating each other up. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, so right now, as it stands, Frankie's in a really good spot. Again, he's, no one's no one's had an answer for him yet in, in two rounds now. Even if the qualifying's not gone you know, completely to the plan, he's doing enough to get the job done. And no one else really is in Moto2 right now. Miguel Oliveira might be a legitimate contender without even realizing it. Mm, we'll come on to him in a second. Cause I think he was probably, again, another of our stars of the weekend out in Argentina, Miguel Oliveira. Um, but Alex Marquez, we talked about him a bit before we started this show. Um is this progress for Alex Marquez? I mean, if he, this is the first time really he's looked like a guy about to win a Moto2 race. He's never really looked like a front-running threat until now in Moto2. But he kind of undid all that by falling out on the final lap. So so where are we at now with Alex Marquez as a rider in Moto2? Is he any closer to getting it than he was a year ago? Not if he keeps crashing it like that. That's that, That's the ultimate problem. Yeah, in terms of raw ability, yes, Marquez has definitely improved from where he was two years ago. Um, the problem is, is that we've seen this story before where he's had flashes of true brilliance. Again, 
But I remember the fourth in Bruno and the fourth at Silverstone a couple of years ago. And then last season, he had that second at Aragon where, again, he looked really, really good. Um, but ultimately, if he keeps crashing it, then what's the point? And, and you've got to finish first. First, you've got to finish. And Marquez has always had a crashing problem. He, 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 he makes silly mistakes that costs him chunky points on multiple occasions. We saw it last year, and we're seeing it again this year. He's had multiple top six running sort of results before crashing, and if he can't iron that part of his game out, he's never gonna be. He's never gonna be the guy we all think he could be. So it doesn't really matter how fast he's going if he can't keep it upright. Then it's all for naught. That's the problem. Mm. Yeah, I, I do sort of have a little bit of sympathy for Alex as well. And particularly again, we're going back to our old mates at BT Sport again. Um, in terms of the criticism that he often gets, I always think that if his last name wasn't Marquez, he wouldn't get half as much as criticism as he does uh, from some quarters. Yeah. Um, because, because they want him to be successful. Because they, they want they him to be Mark. Him to be- <laughs> they, they want him to be Mark, unfortunately. And unfortunately, he isn't. It doesn't help when Mark says that apparently Alex is more talented than he is as well, um, which Mark has said in the past. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I do have sympathy for, for Alex Marquez in that he... This was the first time, as I say, that he actually looked like winning a Moto2 race because he, he was right behind Morbidelli um, on that final lap. He was a couple of bike lengths behind him. Um, and in some ways, he kind of has to take a leaf out of his brother's book, doesn't he? Which kind of like, sounds like an odd thing to say given that Mark crashed too last weekend. Mm. Um, but but Mark, Mark knows, or he knew last year, when to take his medicine and take second. And it's almost as if Alex Marquez didn't want to let it go on the final lap. He didn't want to just accept that second was the result there and second was what he was going to get. He had to try and go over the edge to try and win it. And when he went over the edge, he went over the handlebars. He didn't look like he was going to win that race. Mm. That was and the problem. If no one had told him. Yeah, it's like, dude, Frankie's eight bike levels in front of you. You're not going to win it from here. Like... It's, it's maybe again, maybe his, his eyes got bloodshot and he saw the win and he thought, oh, I'm going to really go for this. And I don't think he had the ability to be able to beat Frankie on the day. I think Frankie had it um, in going into that final lap. And as you say, Marquez probably went a little bit too far trying to chase something that probably wasn't there. And it's a shame because second would have matched his career high finish from last year in Aragon. And that, I mean, if, like, given that Marquez went absolutely nuts over finishing second there last year and was basically kicking the guard fence in celebration, knowing that was just a second, mm. like take the second, like 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 go, it's clear that Mark VDS is, is going well, and you know they've got a really good bike underneath them this year. They've got the resources for it. They seem to be back to something like their 2014, 2015 strength where. It was when it was Rabat and Calio, and they were just winning everything. It, it looks like they've got the measure of the field right now. Take it where you can get it, Maddox, because you know what? The way he's going, he will get wins if he's able just to keep the bike upright. But he's not doing that right now. He's making silly mistakes. Mm, yeah, he is, and, uh, and he pays pretty badly for it at the weekend. Thomas Luthi, as we mentioned, inheriting the podium in third. But the guy in second really was... Uh, the guy who inherited second from Marquez, as it happened, was really the story of the weekend, along with his team, Miguel Oliveira, for Red Bull KTM IO. And <sighs> Oliveira is only in his second season, let's does not forget, in, in Moto2. <laughs> and many riders take a, a long time to figure it out in this class, as Alex Marquez can attest to. Um, but did we ever think that we'd see Miguel Oliveira and that KTM bike, Dre, not only on pole, but on the podium in second, in their <laughs> second Moto2 race? Oh, hail the dentist. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I Very, very impressed. Like, again, Miguel Oliveira... Surely Michael we Michael. never expected this to come together so quick. No, no, no way. I would never have guessed that. Like, Miguel Oliveira is my, probably my rider of the weekend in, in all three classes. That was incredible. Um, the fact that he got the KTM on pole position in it, only its second ever race, and the fact that it was more than competitive in the race, second half of the race, he was the fastest man on track. Yeah. Um, and that says it all. Like, the KTM has something. And when you've got a rider of, of Miguel Oliveira's class on there... Uh, he is an incredibly intelligent rider. We've mentioned this before on multiple occasions. Like, he's one of the smartest men on two wheels, and it shows. His, his maturity and his pace shows out there, and, you know, he went for it. And again, KTM ultimately didn't quite have the pace in the early going, but Miguel found himself, and that's a good sign. He's only going to get better as, think, as, as, as time goes on. So, 
right now he's doing a very, very good job, and it's only going to get better. And yeah, Miguel Oliveira, whew, what a fantastic performance that was. A well-earned second place. Yeah, and you, you hinted it a little bit earlier on, but in terms of looking for a championship fight, uh, or a championship contender to Morbidelli. I mean, Luti's probably going to be there or thereabouts. He's second at the moment, and he's he's going to have wins as the season goes on. He always he's always good for th- three or four wins in a season in Moto Two. Thomas Luti he hasn't had any yet, um, so we can't rule him out. But outside of that, could more could Ol- uh, Oliveira be the guy to look to for a championship contender? Given that, as you say, both he and that KTM are surely at their weakest now. Surely, if they're going to go one way for the rest of the season, it's going to be up. Isn't it? Uh, isn't it just a breath of fresh air to have someone other than Callis up the front? Yeah, like like that, like that's all I want to point out as well. I mean, yeah, Callis takes up two thirds of the field for good reason. Suter with Danny Kenton right now is nowhere to be seen again. Um, the days of Suter being the top chassis in the class are dead by the looks of it. And yeah, KTM has been a breath of fresh air so far, and Akiyo just keeps getting great results out of his talent. I mean, Brad Binder given he's just had to have his, his the plate in his arm reapplied, um, finishing in ninth, another great result yeah, for him as from well. From miles back on the grid. From, uh, yeah, from miles back in just his second ever Moto2 race. So KTM has got something here. They've really got something here. So Binder and Oliveira will definitely be ones to watch this season. Like KTM has been a breath of fresh air to Moto2. It's been, I think, the shot in the arm that the series needs. So hopefully this just this continues because... Like, Io's got a damn good unit underneath him this year, and it's only going to get better, as I said, as time goes on. Yeah, we'll talk a bit about Binder a little bit later on in the show, because as, as Dre mentioned there, there's some kind of sad news on Brad Binder um, coming later in the show. Um, but yeah, Moto2 is finally getting that variety it's been looking for, hasn't it, Dre? Because it wasn't just the KTMs up there, um, but uh, Javi Vieje, who I've got to admit, I'm becoming more and more of a fan of with every passing weekend, fifth <laughs> on the Tech 3. Um, which Tech 3 haven't had a result like that in Moto2 since Bradley Smith was on the bike, um, yeah. which which tells you everything. Bradley Smith was fourth, and I think it was Aragon 2012 uh, wow. in Moto2. Well, that was the last time Tech 3 had a result this good in this class, and Javi Vierke got it to fifth. Um, Simone Corsi got the speed up to sixth, and Sandro Cortese was the top suitor in eighth. So we had five different constructors in the top eight, which Moto2 has badly needed. Absolutely agreed. It wasn't that wasn't Zevi Vierge like the low key rookie of the year last year? Yeah. He he that... sort of came under the radar towards the end and beat the likes of Oliveira and Co. to take top rookie. Yeah, absolutely. So gosh, um not entirely surprised at that, but again, that's a fantastic result for Tech Free. And if you saw the finish of that race, there was about twelve bikes together <laughs> coming over the line. Like, is this Moto three fellas? Like, what is this? So that was a real surprise to see them all running like that so close together. But that's fantastic to see. It's a very good sign that more chassis are having a bigger influence on Moto2 now. Again, great results from Vierge, from Corsi. Cortese punching that suit well above its weight in eighth place. Again, the good side of Cortese coming through there. So, yeah, nice to see some other guys up there, some variety, rather than just being Calix, 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 all the way down the field. I'm glad that we're getting more variety up there because that's exactly what the bases of Moto2 should have always been from the start. Absolutely. And and, and Vieje, he, he's, he's not even 20 yet. He, he, doesn't turn, he, he doesn't turn 20 until the 30th of April. Um, so he, he's a young rider still, um, certainly in the context of Moto2. Um, t- 19 is young in that class when you've got the likes of Luti who are in their second half of their 20s. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he might even be in his 30s by now, Tom Luti. Um, so that's impressive, whatever way you slice it. And history tells you, if you're Bradley Smith, for instance, that Tech 3 might not be the worst team to put yourself in if you've got MotoGP aspirations further down the road. Um, even though it might not be the most competitive Moto2 bike, if you can impress Hervé Poncheral, you might have a MotoGP bike waiting for you in a couple of years. So, uh, yeah, Viaje, I think, is, is winning admirers, and he's, I have to say, I'm certainly a fan of his from, from watching him so far uh, in mm-hmm. that class. Um, the Moto2 race then finished like this. Morbidelli the winner from Oliveira. Um, then Luti, that completes your podium. Baldazari in fourth. And then the rest of the top ten, the rest of the points, should I say, was made up by Vieje Corsi, Peko Bagnaia, top rookie in seventh, um, Sandro Cortese eighth, Brad Binder ninth, Hafi Siren in tenth, and then completing the top 15 for the points were Schrotter, Marini, Raffin, Agata, and Navarro. And to back up Dre's point from a moment ago, 
Just three seconds separated Vieje in fifth and Navarro, who took the final point in 15th place. Yikes. That was one big group from 5th to 15th across the line. Championship standings then. Morbidelli leads it with a perfect 50. Luti second, 14 points back. Then comes Oliveira in third. Uh, Baldassari is up to fourth on 21. Uh, Vieje is fifth on 18. Nakagami, who had a nightmare, he went down on the first lap. Uh, he's sixth on 16. Then comes Luca Marini in seventh. Pekko Banyaya is up in eighth. Um, what a stellar start he's having on 13 points. Ahead of Marquez, who's ninth on 11. And Simone Corsi completes the top 10 on 10 championship points. Next round of the championship, as we mentioned, is in a week's time. You should listen to this. At the Circuit of the Americas in Austin, Texas. Right, now let's do the news uh, before we go, because there's quite a lot of news, a lot of it from the World Superbike Paddock, actually. Um, but before we come on to that, um, we flagged this up a moment ago, uh, Brad Binder has been in the news, um, and unfortunately it's not good news, because just this afternoon, as we recall, this Thursday afternoon, April the 13th, he has undergone successful a successful operation on his left arm uh, in Barcelona, um, because... Essentially, Dre, he, he broke this over the winter, and riding in the first two races, broke it again. Oh, Jesus. Just just such a horrendous run of luck for Brad Binder, who, again, was the star to look out for going into Moto2 this year after, you know, completely dominating Moto3 last year. It's just, oh, my God. Um, so impressive, but yet so unlucky that he's had to break his arm essentially on two separate occasions already. And this, and this season's barely started yet. Just been nothing but a strain. Um to say the least, but uh, oh. uh, I, I, I can only wish Brad a speedy mm. recovery. We know him well on the show, and he's a tr- he's a class act. He's a tremendous human being, and just a real shame that his Moto2 career has been nothing but dog shit luck so far. Mm. And a- Aki Ayo has um, basically, he's been a little bit vague on it, but he went as far as to say that Brempton will miss some races, uh, in his words, so we're not going to see him for uh, about a month or two yet, unfortunately. Um, and what amazes me, Dre, is um, as, as the MotoGP report, the MotoGP.com report states, um, he felt discomfort early in the weekend, um, did Brad Binder, and the Argentine Grand Prix weekend, that is. Um, he went to the Circuit Medical Center where it was confirmed that the bone that he'd broken over the winter continued to be broken and that the plate that had been applied had moved. Um, oh, shit. And even with all of that, he still came from nowhere on the grid to finish in ninth place. That puts that that ride and that result in some context. That's an incredible performance from Brad Binder, all things considered. Like, like basically, the plate was essentially not doing its job properly no. because of the fact it moved. So not only has he got a broken bone in his arm, he's got a plate that doesn't need to be there at that point. So the fact he's ridden through all of that discomfort and finished in the top 10 is an astonishing performance from Brad Binder and proof that the talent is more than there. He just needs a, a, a clean bill of health. Jeez. Yeah, we, we yeah. wish him very well on this show. He qualified 24th, incidentally. Um, on, on Saturday, so twenty fourth up to ninth with a with That's a broken incredible. arm. Um, we love Brad Binder on this show. We wish you well, Brad, and we hope to see you again uh, very yes, very soon um, in, in Moto Two. Um, World Superbike news, as I mentioned, there's a lot of it uh, this week, um, and a lot. Uh, the first piece of news broke over the course of the Argentine Grand Prix weekend because Dre, World Superbikes is going to Argentina now, although not to Termasteria Hondo. Yeah, that's this is a- odd. That's a weird one, isn't it? It's like, yeah, we're going to go to Argentina, just not that place. Not the circuit even that's act- already built. Yeah, it's like it's kind of weird given that like one of the big problems with Argentina is that it's a track that is not raced on enough to produce like the safest MotoGP racing in the world because it gets so dirty in the off season. Um, so yeah, the fact they go into an entirely new circuit, well, God knows at this point. Like, I, I, I don't get it. That's a baffling decision from me on this one. Again, hopefully. It, it works out in the long run, but that's just very eye-opening and all just sorts of um, interesting. So these, again, maybe Dorna is something that we don't mm. regard. I mean, that, it, it sounds as if it's going to be put in a very exciting location, if nothing else. Um, the 
circuit, the Villicum circuit in Argentina, um, which is in San Juan. It's uh, essentially it's on the what is known as Route 40 um, in Argentina, which is kind of their Route 66. Um, oh, it, it's the, the new circuit will be located on the symbolic Route 40. You can tell I'm reading from the press release here, can't you? A 5,000 kilometer road. <laughs> Um, which stretches from the north to the south of Argentina. It's kind of think of a road that goes, a straight line road that goes from Lanzan to John O'Groats, and that's pretty much what you're talking about uh, in Argentina. Um, it's a tourist attraction, if nothing else, but it now will also have a motorsport circuit um, along it as well. Um, and World Superbikes will be going there next year uh, in 2018, because this circuit is already in the process of being built. Um, so you've got to think that this announcement has already, this kind of has been in the works for a while now. Um, this this move, uh, and it has to be said, Dre. Well, Superbikes is still largely a European va- based championship. So yeah, I'd say so. It, it, it's it's if nothing else, even though it's not the circuit we expected, it's good for the championship that it's going to going to South America and going to Argentina. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I missed the days of MotoGP being in Brazil um, back when I was a <laughs> child. So I'm I'm glad we're getting more South Af- South American flavor on the calendar. Um, to say the least, I do miss those days of Fakasa and being in South Africa and, you know, again, the Nelson PK circuit in Brazil. That was another very solid racetrack indeed. So I'm glad that we're getting more South, South America back in the series. And as you say, Worlds is such a European-based sport right now. We, you got rounds in France, Italy, Argentina, the United Kingdom, every you know every major European country you can think of. Yeah, we've like, got two in Italy, it's... two in Spain. We've got, we've got yeah. one in Germany. We, yeah, we, yes, yeah. we got one in France. It's, it's yeah, it's, it needs a bit of variety in there. We've only really got we've got what Australia at the start of the year. We've got Texas halfway through, uh, not Texas uh, Laguna halfway through Laguna Seca, uh, and then. Qatar at the end of the year. That's about it. Um, yeah. The rest of the European venues. So yeah, it it needs a change, and and we're we're glad we're going to get it because what one thing that's been made pretty clear, Dre, from from the MotoGP attendances is that that part of the world loves its bike racing. It absolutely does. I mean, Argentina was a sellout, and again, like the the audience is there for we we just we've just got to make an effort and go over there because. Like you go to places like Thailand, and again, the, the, the Thais absolutely love their bikes, and that that whole South East Southeast Asian block loves their bikes in general. Um, so there, there's pockets of really big fan bases there, just just ready to go, and it's just it's just a shame that like these series are so focused on the European rounds when there's audiences around the world that they could get and truly call themselves a world championship yeah. rather than having all these rounds in Europe. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and um, yeah, it's it, it appears this is that Borrowram circuit in Thailand as well. That will be becoming a MotoGP venue very, very soon as well. So um, yeah, you, you you might well see the uh, the packed grandstands of Borrowram in a MotoGP race very, very soon, uh, which would be great to see. Yeah, World Superbikes heading to Argentina next year. Um, we don't quite know yet when it will fit in the calendar. Um, you'd like to think summer somewhere to fill that gap, but I don't know whether I the so. I don't know whether the uh, the the climate there will allow that. We'll wait and see. Uh, they will have a rider, of course, uh, to cheer for if the uh, current grid is repeated next season. Of course, Leandro Mercado is an Argentine um, yes, on the indeed. World Superbike grid, so they they do potentially have their own rider to follow. And as we've seen in uh, in MotoGP, they they very much they're quite tribal, aren't they? With like Yoni Hernandez, who's a Colombian, but they almost treat them treat him as their own rider in MotoGP. I remember um, Julian Ryder the way he phrased it which is very much on united kingdom like um where he kind of said that the the south americans they almost treat south america as a country and all different countries are kind of different regions within it um and they kind of like they treat their south american rider and yoni hernandez as their home rider at the argentine grand prix even though, yeah, he's, even though he's colombian um so um yeah when they have their own rider from argentina to support imagine what the the atmosphere will be like next year so that's for next year uh, in world superbikes as for this year we have seen the last of marcus reiterberger unfortunately um in world superbikes and, and this is a really sad story to be honest Dre. i mean he had that horrendous injury at the end of last season or that ended his season um the broken back the broken t10 and t12 vertebra um yes. that, that reiterberger suffered at mizano um and it's made mm-hmm. it's been made pretty clear that those injuries haven't fully healed and it's got to the point where Reiterberg has decided to sit the rest of the season out. That is awful because a World Superbike season is so long. You're looking at February all the way through to October. So that's that puts it into perspective. I mean, like Marcus is basically saying, I, I can't ride a bike for six months and it's not worth riding this season through this pain. And that it takes it takes a big man hmm. to 
to, you know, to, to basically say, I can't ride this bike to the best of my ability. It's better off in the hands of someone else. And I've talked about it on, 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 our, on our sister show, Sport 101, about Pascal Verline recently and some of the shit he's had to go through by being questioned by members of the media and former drivers for basically not hopping back into a car after he cracked his neck mm. um, in January at the Race of Champions um, and basically being judged for basically not hopping back in the car straight away, given that these F1 cars now are putting nearly 7G through the corners and with, you know, with a cracked neck where one more incident could paralyze him from the neck down. And for the fact that Marcus, right. Again, I'm glad that the biking world hasn't, doesn't jumped to the same conclusion. Cause I think it's more of an understanding thing in the biking world where riders ride through pain much more commonly, much more like injuries are, are a lot more commonplace in Moto yeah, GP. The consequences of crashing are a lot greater. Exactly. I mean, it goes without saying as to why that is. And, I think there's a much greater level of understanding that these riders so often ride hurt. I mean, look at Ian Oney. He missed four rounds last season. Uh, I think Dino Petrucci did the same. He missed the opening four rounds of his hand injury. Mm. James Tozen had to retire after repeated wrist injuries where he, he could have lost all function in his right hand. Yeah, and, um, I mean, Bradley Smith, it's pretty much common knowledge that Bradley Smith will never really sort of walk in the same way again from that injury he suffered last year. Yeah, and that was that was a he, he basically shattered his leg, um, and it's it's not going to heal properly. It's not going to heal in the right way, especially as a bike rider where you're constantly risking injury every time you hop on hop on a bike. So I, I, I'm glad that Marcus, especially for such a young man, has taken such a mature decision. He's only 23. He means a year younger than me, and that, that says a lot. And I'm not the I'm not the oldest guy on this show by any stretch of the imagination. Well, not regularly anyway. Sorry, Max. Hi. Um, but in any case, yeah, I mean, Marcus is 23. He just, he just turned 23 a couple of months ago. And the, he, I'm glad he's taken such a mature decision. And I'm glad he's thinking of the long game because I would hate to hear a tragic story of him not being able to walk again or some, or some horrible de- debilitating injury that could hurt him for the rest of his life. Yeah, I mean, I, I think of I think of Joan Lascores, the, the ex-Kawasaki factory rider in, in World Superbikes who had a testing crash at Imola and he's been in a wheelchair ever since and will remain in a wheelchair, uh, unfortunately, given the, the, the extent of his injuries at that circuit. Um, and yeah, it's it, it doesn't bear thinking about what can happen to, to riders who, you know, re-injure pretty sort of, pretty sort of, I'm trying to think of the words, really dangerous parts of their anatomy, basically parts that you, yeah. you don't mess about with. I mean, everyone can Absolutely. recover from a broken a broken hand or a broken wrist, but yeah, when we're talking about back injuries and, and vertebrae injuries, um, Max, you know, you're getting into the realms, yeah, you're getting into the realms of paralysis, which which we don't want. Um, so Reiterberg has made this decision. Um, unfortunately, it means the end of his of his association with Altea, which is which is really sad because it, it, it's sad and it sounds kind of heartless. But Altea can't really because he's only really with the team on a one year deal for the end of the season. So that's kind of it with him um, with Altea yeah. BMW because they're not going to give him a new contract for next season. Who would at this stage? Um, no, as hard as it sounds, it's too risky. So. Um, yeah, that's the end, unfortunately, from Marcus Reiterberg at Altea. So hopefully, once he's regained fitness, another team will will take a chance on him. And uh, the team boss of Altea, uh, Genicio Bevilacqua, uh, kind of made this point that um, the decision leaves us all sad. Me personally, the, Ante- the entire Altea team and BMW too. But I believe it's normal that he wants to find that peace of mind. It's not just a a physical state it's also his confidence that has just been completely shattered and um, by having to ride through this injury as he makes the point marcus is still only 23 and so showed um or oh, so has all the time he needs to recover and bounce back i can only thank him for the commitment he showed throughout his stay with the altea team and we all wish him lots of luck in the hope that we soon see him back stronger than ever and whatever the bike he can no doubt still find the physical conditions he needs to shape his future um, so those are the words of the team manager of Altea BMW, uh, Genicio Bevilacqua, and we wish Marcus Reiterberger uh, the Absolutely. very, very best in his recovery. His spot, by the way, for the rest of the season will be taken by the third rider, essentially the test rider for Altea, uh, Raffaele De Rosa, um, who rode for the team in Stock 1000 last year. Uh, he now mm-hmm. steps up to their World Superbike team and will race for them for the rest of the season. Uh, the final piece of World Superbike news to bring you um, is much more positive news, thankfully, and it surrounds the UK round. 
um, of the uh, World Superbike Championship, the Tom Sykes round of the championship. Um, <laughs> but he won't be the only Brit in town because, of course, not only will Jonathan Ray, Chaz Davies, Alex Lowe's and the likes be there, but also Leon Haslam will be there. And he's the most yeah, he's yeah. the most local of local riders at Donington Park. He's very much a local boy at that place. Um, mm. And um, if anything, Dre, he showed a week ago uh, in BSB that he's pretty quick around there and he'll be wild carding for the Pachetti Kawasaki team too on a ZX-10R. Well, what better advert for a wild card round than a world superbike round at Donington than winning b- both races yeah. in the domestic round? There's no better advertisement than that. And yeah, absolutely. Ewan Haslam is a local guy. He's he's done thousands and thousands of laps around Donington Park in his, in his years. And that is a great wild card addition to the team. A home a hometown guy, an easy guy to root for. In which is crazy enough, given that the, the entire elite tier of world team bikes is pretty much British at this point. Mm. Yeah, we can add one more Brit there in Leon Haslam, who again is is, is a is a race winner at world superbike level and is a, is a, is a, still a class rider on in, in, on any level. Um, so yeah, to bring him in as a wild card, fantastic addition to the grid for for, for the for the uh, world team bike. Basically, what's essentially a home round for the series, mm. given that uh, again, as we say, the field is is got such a strong British contingent. So another one to add can't hurt so great addition to get leon haslam in yeah adds a, adds another new story another story to that weekend i mean we don't know quite what the championship state of play will be by that point whether jonathan ray will have wrapped up pretty much by then uh, or whether Chaz davis will be chasing him down of course we'll have tom sites going for the ty dillinger uh the perfect 10 uh, at donington park he's won eight in a row um so so there's a lot to look forward to for the british round of the championship which is in around six weeks from now it's the same sunday as the uh, day of day of classics as we're calling it here most one day of classics two um, with the, the Indy 500, the Monaco Grand yes. Prix, that very same weekend, it's the uh, British round of the World Superbike Championship as well um, at well. Donington Park. Um, so a lot going on. Um, this weekend, though, the only show in town is the British Superbikes Championship because that moves on to Brands Hatch. Of course, they couldn't run there for their opening round of the season because British touring cars had already booked it. Um, so they're running there for round two this time. Um, Donington hosting the season opener. And, um, yeah, it's there's an interesting subplot to this, Dre, this weekend. Because, of course, Haslam leads the championship, having won two out of two. Um, but, of course, this weekend, on home soil, we see the return of Shaky Byrne. And we finally get to see where he would figure in this race for the title. Spoiler alert, it's probably at the front. Yep. <laughs> um, given it is shaky, but absolutely. that's the That was, I think, the big, like... The uh, what if the big what if and the cloud that I think hung over Donington a fortnight ago was just where Shaky would have fit into that. It, it, it did feel like his presence was needed in, in, in that race, in, in that race weekend. Haslam was not challenged in either race really. Um, and again, we were all asking ourselves, well, where's Shaky? And the, I, the tweet I had immediately after the race two finished was, I would love to have seen where Shaky would have would have figured um, in all of that. And uh, yeah, well, I'd, I'd love to have known. So we're going to find out. Again, maybe not the best example because Brands Hatch in the Indy layout is such a, it's like a, it's basically the biking version of an oval yeah. at this point, and it's only you're looking at forty odd second laps and oval runnings and anything. If we're being honest, it, it yeah, anything can happen. And let's be honest here, James Ellison is very strong on this layout, and that's going to be one to watch out for. If Yamaha's tire issues or anything to go by, uh, maybe it could be an issue later on. But I think Ellison will be one to watch, given he won the double here a couple of years ago and has been very strong around here. But I would love to see where Shaky fits into the field, probably at the front. Will anyone way to find out though? Mm, yeah. If- from a spectator's point of view and um by the time you're listening to this if you listen to this either on early access or when it goes live um it's they're racing on easter monday um at, at brands hatch mm-hmm. so there's still plenty of time for you to get yourself down there I, not only would it be on the indie layout uh Dre will attest to from the grand prix layout it's it's a great spectator experience but on the brands Absolutely. hatch indie circuit wherever you're sat you see the whole circuit um and, so and I, can, I can tell you now i'm going there on monday myself oh, oh really <laughs> Oh, very, very good. Uh, well, Dre will be able to tell yes. you yourself how, how great it is. Um, you kept that one quiet. Yeah, I only just found out myself literally in the taping of this show. <laughs> thanks, to good, thanks to good friend and former host Adam Johnson, um, who's, whose dad has has mates in the area. Um, so he's been able to hook me up with, with, with a ticket to go. It's just a matter of getting my way over there, basically. But uh, yeah, it looks like I'm... In between my, my my two days of work, I'm going to be going to Brands on the Monday, so I'm really looking forward to that. Excellent. Going back there again. Yeah, Easter Monday for for the racing at Brands. So um, yeah, you've got another reason to get yourself down there now. You can meet Dre in person. Um, hey. But um, but yeah, so 
it, it's a great spectator weekend because they're actually, I mean, this is of absolutely no consequence to any of you because it'll have already happened by the time you listen to this, but they're actually doing an extra test on the Good Friday um, oh. brands for the benefit of the fans that go there. So um, any fans that went there, I guess I should say, on Good Friday, um, got to see an extra official test on the Friday of British Superbikes. And they're also, because of the tragic circumstances unfortunately of donnington and the, the british super Sports, british super sports sprint race easy for me to say that didn't happen um on the saturday of the donnington weekend there are effectively going to be three races from british super sport this weekend two sprint races and a feature race um of course the donnington sprint race never happened so um yeah you get even more value for your money this weekend um two sprint races one on Sunday lunchtime, one on Sunday afternoon slash evening after qualifying, and then another on the Monday, Easter Monday. Um, so it's going to be one hell of a weekend at Brian's Hatch on the Indie Circuit. Get yourself down there if you can um, to watch it. We will be back next week to review whatever happens at Brian's Hatch. Um, likely that it will be um, Rebecca James joining me next week, if we can get hold of her, um, to join myself <laughs> next week. We shall see. Um, we'll be back this time next week. Um, Motorsport 101 episode 82 comes next week. Uh, looking back on the Bahrain Grand Prix, Jure will be on his um, hiatus, not the uh, not the Mika Hakkinen kind. Um, we hope I it will won't be quite come back. I yeah, promise. it will be, won't be quite as long as that. Um, so uh, in Dre's absence, um, RJ O'Connell and Ryan King will be bringing you that one. Um, perhaps with invited guests, we'll wait and see. Um, but that will be. In all probability, Wednesday of next week and Bike Live will come on the Friday once again. Um, but that brings us to the end of episode 7 of Bike Live. Huge thank you uh, to all of you for listening and for downloading this week's edition. Huge thank you to Andre Harrison uh, for joining me this week. Enjoy the BSB. Um, thank you, sir. And, um, and we look forward to talking to you all again here on Motorsport 101 Bike Live this time next week. Uh, we look forward to your company then, but until then, it's goodbye.